Hello everyone, Golden Nova here. This is the compiled version of all the Hero Explained videos, issues 1 through 4. While the content is largely the same, I've gone through the footage to make some changes. The audio and visual mistakes should be fixed, I added a couple of cards that flew under the radar on the initial check, as well as the introduction of a few guest lines I wasn't able to get in the original version. I've also added an extended credit sequence at the end to talk about everyone involved, so I'd greatly appreciate it if you gave that a watch, as so many people helped contribute to get this video done, and I'd love for them to get the same amount of admiration and attention that this series has gotten. Okay, that's it for the prologue. Now, back to the video. I've got a question for you. What makes a hero? Is it the strength of their shoulders to carry the world's burdens? Is it the stoutness of their heart to connect with and heal the downtrodden? Is it the lightning-quick instinct to throw themselves into danger at a moment's notice? Or is it that every letter of the word hero is capitalized in their name? Well, in the context of this video, the answer may surprise you. Hello everyone, Golden Nova here, and it's time to tackle the daunting, the impossible, a task never before attempted by man nor machine alike, a barrier far beyond which any explained video has yet reached for. It's time for Heroes Explained. The signature deck of Jaden Yuki, the iconic Slifer Slacker and five-time winner of the Best Smile in Domino City Award, Heroes made their debut in the 2005 set The Lost Millennium. And while it saw absolutely zero eh, competitive relevance upon release, the theme struck a chord in the fan base that's been going strong till this very day. It's seen a number of updates, both within the canon of GX and beyond, and has worn the mask of a number of different playstyles, from the control-oriented hero beat to the explosive combo version you see today. And in this video, we're going to catalog the nearly 16 years of hero releases, from the good, the bad, and the weird. And maybe, just maybe, we'll learn a little trivia along the way. In fact, before we get into the meat of all this, let's share a little something right now. If you're new to the hero scene, you might not know that old hero names were formatted like this. Hero wasn't really given any special spelling rules, it just looked like any other name on the card. So why did they feel the need to go back and change all the old ones so they looked like this? Well, you'd be surprised at the number of cards that happen to have hero in their name without even realizing it. For instance, Dinah, Hero for Hire, would end up working with anything that supports hero monsters. We've got a few obvious cards like this, but there are a few that are a bit more tricky. Like Sephiris Lady. See it yet? Here, let me help. See? Hidden hero card, can't have that. What about this innocent piece of Reptilian support? Nope, without these changes, attack Pheromones would be part of the theme. So they beefed up all the letters and made it so the full capitalization is what really makes it a hero card. It's... A very arbitrary solution? Like, if capitalization mattered, then Spiritual Beast Tamer Winda shouldn't count as a Ritual Beast Tamer monster, but the one that really gets my goat is Photon Generator Unit. Technically, it shouldn't be able to function because there's no such monster as Cyber Dragons. Like, tribute two monsters named Cyber Dragon, that works, but the way it's worded now it has no legal targets it can use for cost. But that's enough about a different beloved GX archetype, I'll get to you later. For now it's time to begin our long haul through one of Yu-Gi-Oh's most iconic archetypes, and I've assembled the most prolific team of hero lovers to help me through it. Unfurl your capes, get on your spandex, and strike your most dramatic pose, cause it's time to explain heroes! But. Before we continue, I wanted to take some time to thank all of you who are watching, because I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. Sit back, enjoy, and if you end up liking what you see, please consider subscribing and supporting me and the other wonderful people who helped make this video possible by using the links below. Thank you all so much for your time, and now, back to the world of comics. Issue number one, Elemental. Look at heroes long enough and you'll start to notice that each category follows their own distinct influence. For elemental heroes, they're largely based on western comic books. The tights, the capes, the whole nine yards. That is, if you're looking at the heroes found primarily in the anime. The manga versions still have these, but they lean much more into the elements of nature. Oh goodness, not even a full paragraph in and we're already talking about the subcategories of elemental heroes, which is already a subcategory of heroes as a whole. This is going to get wild, but before we begin breaking things down, I'd like to front load that all heroes, with a few exceptions, are warrior type, but very wildly in every other metric. So with that out of the way, let's start with part one, the anime. 
And what's a better place to begin with than the original Fabulous Five? Not only are they the faces of the original hero lineup, they've each got some signature moves to show off as well. Elemental Hero Avion is a level 3 wind normal monster with 1000 attack and defense. He's a winged elemental hero who wheels through the sky and manipulates the wind. His signature move, Feather Break, gives villainy a blow from sky high. Uh, they're also an alumni of the illustrious sky high, but uh, that's neither here nor there. You can see their signature move in action on the normal spell, Feather Shot. You target one face of Elemental Hero Avion you control, and during that turn, it can attack a number of times equal to the number of monsters you controlled when Feather Shot resolved. But that Avion can't attack directly, and your other monsters can't attack at all. This one's a bit suspect. No matter how many attacks you get, a thousand attack points isn't going to get you very far. But you can use a card we'll talk about later, Hero Mask, to make any monster you control into Elemental Hero Avion, and now it can attack a whole bunch of times. It's a pretty janky combo, but if you're looking for something kooky, then hey, shoot your shot, I guess. Another signature move at our Feathered Friend's disposal is Featherwind, a counter trap that can be activated in response to a spell or trap card being activated while you control Avion, and on resolution, it's negated and destroyed. And they say heroes don't have interaction or negation, they've had it since the very beginning! Do these people even read cards from 2005? They also appear on an unrelated card, Mirage Tube, a quick play spell that you curiously can't play from the hand, making it functionally a trap card. If a face-up monster you control is targeted for an attack, you can flip it up and your opponent takes a thousand damage. I... I don't know what's going on here. Like, Avion is there, and so is Burfamet for some reason, and they're just ignoring the giant rainbow tube that's blasting the duelist. It's... I... We're moving on to the next card. Next, we've got Elemental Hero Burstenatrix, a level 3 fire normal monster with 1200 attack and 800 defense. She's a flame manipulator who was the first Elemental Hero woman. Her burst fire burns away villainy, and her fiery glare melts away the bravado of anyone else creeping after a little girl. Anyone else remember that episode? <laughs> oh god, that was weird. And Burst Fire can be seen in the normal spell, Burst Return. You can only activate it if you control Burst Inatrix, and once it resolves, you bounce every other face-up elemental hero on the field to its owner's hand. This is another weird one. Technically, you can pull the same Mask Hero shenanigans as with Feather Shot, but since it only works against elemental heroes, you'd have to be setting up a really weird counter. Though, if you're in the mirror match, it's a stupid effective way to clear fusions and reset your own on summon effects like Stratos, but then you'd have to be playing elemental hero Burst Inatrix, which, you know, hot take here, but it's not very good. Next is Elemental Hero Clayman, a level 4 Earth Normal monster with 800 attack and 2000 defense. He's an elemental hero with a clay body built to last. He'll preserve his elemental hero colleagues at any cost. Now, comics-wise, Clayman clearly takes inspiration from Juggernaut, but I'm putting my money on him being inspired by Beast from the X-Men on account of him calling his teammates colleagues. What a nerd. Clayman's signature move is Clay Charge, a normal trap that you can activate if your opponent targets a Clayman you control for an attack, even if it's face down. That's pretty funky. On resolution, you destroy the attacking monster and Clayman, then burn your opponent for 800. So it's a 1 for 2 piece of reactive removal, and the upside is Ukazi. Wow, how is everyone sleeping on such amazing cards? Why is no one playing Clay Control with this? Next is Elemental Hero Sparkman, a level 4 light normal monster with 1600 attack and 1400 defense. He's an elemental hero and a warrior of light who proficiently wields many kinds of armaments. His static shockwave cuts down the path of villainy. Dang, no wonder this dude's stats are so good. They're a warrior of light, and I'd love to focus on the Final Fantasy reference here, but I can't. Because I found out original Princess Sparkman has his attack name as Shining Surge Flash. I guess to keep the name in line with the anime. But you won't see me complaining. Static Shock is an awesome hero, so having a whole wave of them is electrifying. And while the flavor text says that he wields many kinds of armaments, we only ever get to see one, which is Spark Blaster. It's an equip spell that can only be equipped onto Sparkman, and its effect is that during your main phase, you can change the battle position of any face-up monster. Now there isn't a once per turn clause on this card, but very specifically, it destroys itself after using its effect three times. It's not a very strong tech during this current Link format, but it doesn't specify that it has to be used on your opponent's monsters. So you can make some attack with weaker monsters then change them to defense position, 
Or, or you could bring back the Age of Clown Control, setting up a White Dragon Ninja so that your Spark Blaster can't destroy itself, then change the battle position of your preferred clown as many times as you want to trigger its effects. The last member of the first five is Elemental Hero Bubble Man, a level 4 water monster with 800 attack and 1200 defense. I don't know if they meant to mirror Burstinatrix's stats, but if they did, that's a pretty nice touch. If Bubble Man is the only card in your hand, you can special summon them. And if it's the only card you control and you have no cards in hand when summoned, you get to draw two cards. The physical manifestation of snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, Bubble Man can take you from a completely abysmal game state to having up to two playable cards and an on-field monster to work with, and it doesn't even cost you your normal summon. However, despite its awesome effect, I do have to dock some points. See, while it's pretty rare to see its full effect go off, it still makes for a free level 4 special summon, especially an old bubble beat deck list where it was used to help make exceed monsters. There's only one E hero that gets to be an exceed monster, and it's not even tournament legal! But out of all the heroes we've talked about thus far, they certainly have the most tricks. For instance, Bubble Illusion. It's a quick play spell you can activate if you control Bubble Man, and for the rest of the turn you can activate a trap card from your hand. That's... Wait, what the heck? That's amazing! Oh no, it's fine, I'll keep my trap cards in my hand this turn, thank you very much. I've got Bubble Man. This Paleozoic support kicks butt! Next is Bubble Shuffle, another quick play spell. It has you targeting a monster your opponent controls and a Bubble Man you control, both in face-up attack position, and on resolution you change both of them to defense position, then tribute your Bubble Man to summon any elemental hero from your hand. Okay, this one is a bit more underwhelming. It's a neat trick to get out Blade Edge while setting up your opponent's monster for some sweet piercing damage, but it's not going to make your opponent shuffle up anytime soon. Their last special card is Bubble Blaster. It's also a spell, but of the equipped variety this time, that can only be equipped to Bubble Man and grants them 800 attack, putting them on par with Spark Man. Also, if the equipped Bubble Man would be destroyed by a battle, you can send Blaster to the grave instead, as well as reducing the damage you take to zero. It certainly has the least utility of the three spells, and if Bubble Man is being used as intended, it's not going to stick around long enough to reap the benefits of this card, and... Well, let's just say that if you're a fan of this card, I'd hate to burst your bubble. And if those weren't enough, they've even got an alternate form. Elemental Hero Neo Bubble Man has all the same stats as their original form, but can't be normal summoned or set. Instead, you must send an original Bubble Man from your field to the grave, as well as the spell card Metamorphosis from your hand to the grave to special summon this Cape Crusader from your hand. Thankfully, it counts as its previous form while it's on the field, so you can use all the Bubble Man cards with it, and it destroys any monster it battles with at the end of the damage step. It's a pretty ineffective way to get a worse El Shadal construct, but what's funny is that it's effectively banned. I mean, if you have a card that can ignore summoning conditions, you can still get this on the field, but since Metamorphosis is banned, this hero's gameplay days are finished. So that's our original 5, but we've got a lot more main deck heroes to talk about. Elemental Hero Wildheart is a level 4 earth monster at 1500 attack and 1600 defense, and they're unaffected by trap cards. This tall stack of beefcake can walk right through a torrential tribute and not feel a thing. I'm just not sure how it falls into the whole elemental part of this hero team. I mean, unless we're operating on Captain Planet rules, then it all makes sense. And they aren't without their own signature card either. Cyclone Boomerang is an equipped spell that can only be equipped to Wildheart, and it gains 500 attack while equipped. Also, if Wildheart is destroyed by a card effect while equipped, you Heavy Storm the field, then burn your opponent for 100 damage for each card destroyed. This kinda slaps, because it doesn't specify your opponent has to destroy Wildheart, so if you have the cards for it, you can proc the spell and trap sweep yourself. Sure, it's another roundabout combo, but if your opponent's back row is stacked, it's a massive windfall. Elemental Hero Necroshade is a level 5 dark monster with 1600 attack and 1800 defense, and once while it's in the grave, you can normal summon one level 5 or higher elemental hero monster from your hand without a tribute. The level's a little funky for a monster with such a sweet grave effect, but heroes are a fusion archetype, so you'll find a way to get them out of your hand somehow. Seems a bit dark for the living ray of sunshine that is Jaden Yuki, but what really gets me is that it looks like what would happen if Kazuki Takahashi had the chance to redesign Lord Zed from Power Rangers. But what are we gonna summon with this effect? Another Necro Shade? Wrong. It's for Elemental Hero Blade Edge, a level 7 earth monster with 2600 attack and 1800 defense, and it deals piercing battle damage. I hesitate to call this a win condition, but it gives you a way to run over a lot of monsters if you don't have access to your extra deck. And because it can deal damage no matter what, it certainly gives you an edge over more defensive strategies. And they have their own signature move as well. 
Edge Hammer is a normal trap you can activate by tributing a Wild Edge you control and targeting an opponent's monster. On resolution, you destroy that target and inflict damage to your opponent equal to the destroyed monster's original attack. So, you can run over a smaller monster, deal piercing damage, then tribute them off to Edge Hammer to get rid of another monster, hopefully something bigger than Blade Edge, and burn them for even more. Talk about hammering home the point. One thing that all the heroes we've gone over so far have in common is that they're all specifically named Material on a number of hero fusions. So now that they're all covered, let's go over how we can mix and match them. Oh, and it should be noted that they all share the same must be fusion summoned and cannot be special summoned by other ways clause. Elemental hero Flame Wingman is the iconic hero fusion, being showcased in a number of support cards and is the first one that debuted in the anime. It's a level 6 wind fusion monster with 2100 attack and 1200 defense points, requiring elemental heroes Avion and Burstinatrix as material. When they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you burn your opponent for damage equal to the attack in the grave of the monster it destroyed. So this means it can burn your opponent even if they hide behind a defense position monster, and if they run over another attack position monster that's basically like getting a direct attack. What a great wingman. And it's not the only one that has those materials. Elemental Hero Phoenix Enforcer is a level 6 fire fusion monster. It has 2100 attack and 1200 defense. It also needs our favorite birdie boy and fire girl. And this monster can't be destroyed by battle. So why does this card exist? Well, in the anime, it really is just Astro Phoenix's version of Flame Wingman, so it helps differentiate between the two duelists. But this does open the door to a fan theory that every elemental hero fusion we've seen has an alternate form, with each combination changing form depending on which one is the dominant element. Flame Wingman is wind, so Avion is the dominant one there, but Phoenix Enforcer is fire, so Percinatrix is topping. And Astro could be holding a whole rogues gallery of all these alternate heroes. It's a shame we never really got to see that since he transitioned to Destiny Heroes basically right away. It would've been really cool to see that explored in his arc of the incarnation. Sadly, the writers didn't really do anything to re-enforce that theory. <laughs> Get it? Enforce? Like the like the name? Yeah, you know, it's funny because I have to explain the joke. It, it's a good one, I promise. You see, because of the namesake, it's really similar. Elemental Hero Mariner is a level 5 water fusion monster with 1400 attack and 1000 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion and Bubble Man. And while you have any face down cards in your spell and trap zone, Mariner can attack directly. Not a huge threat by itself, but synergizes very well with attack boosting and multi-attacking effects. Heck, if you can manage to keep monsters on your opponent's field, this makes for a pretty strong Mystic Mind win condition. I mean, it worked for Sky Strikers. Just be careful where you play something like that. I know quite a few people who would be more than comfortable tying one of those anchors around you and watching you play stall with the fishies. Elemental Hero Wild Wingman is a level 8 Earth Fusion monster with 1900 attack and 2300 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion and Wild Heart. Their effect is pretty simple, you can discard a card to target a spell or trap on the field and destroy it, and it lacks a hard once per turn clause anywhere on it, so as long as you've got cards in your hand, you've got Mystical Space Typhoons. I just wish it was more Bison themed, because then it would be a Buffalo Wild Wingman. Elemental Hero Dark Bright is a level 6 dark fusion monster with 2000 attack and 1000 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Sparkman and Necroshade. It deals piercing battle damage like Blade Edge, but gets switched to defense position at the end of the damage step if it attacks. However, just because it's easier to run over in that state doesn't mean it's without consequence. Because if Dark Bright is destroyed at all, you can target any monster your opponent controls and destroy it. So it's a decent attacker, is a way to get Necroshade into the grave, and trades favorably with just about anything. So despite the attack drawback, I prefer to look on the Dark Bright side of things. Elemental Hero Thunder Giant is a level 6 light fusion monster with 2400 attack and 1500 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Sparkman and Clayman. Once per turn, you can discard a card to target a face-up monster on the field with an original attack less than Thunder Giant's current attack and destroy it. While it's not going to be taking down any monarchs anytime soon, being able to convert a card in hand to monster removal is a pretty sweet deal, especially if you're trying to fast track a card into your grave like Necroshade. Get the ACDC ready because when this giant hits the field, your opponent's gonna be Thunderstruck. Elemental Hero Plasma Vice is a level 8 light fusion monster with 2600 attack and 2300 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Sparkman and Blade Edge. It maintains the latter's ability to deal piercing battle damage, and much like Thunder Giant, you can discard a card to destroy a monster, but this time it works on any attack position monster, regardless of their attack points. 
Overall, just a solid improvement over Thunder Giant, but it does mean you'll have to run the level 7 hero that requires a very specific setup to summon without much hassle. It may be an indulgent deck building choice, but hey, we all have our vices. Elemental Hero Mudball Man is a level 6 Earth Fusion monster with 1900 attack and 3000 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Bubble Man and Clay Man. And that's really all there is to say about it. It doesn't have any useful effects, but because of the can only be fusion summoned clause, it doesn't even count as a non-effect monster for, like, silly 10 -y purposes. Despite the artwork, this card is anything but well-rounded. Elemental Hero Rampart Blaster is a level 6 Earth Fusion monster with 2000 attack and 2500 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Clayman and Bastinatrix as fusion material. It can attack while it's in defense position, making it sort of like a prototype for the Super Heavy Samurai archetype, but only if your opponent controls no monsters. And if it does attack, its attack is half during damage calculation. I assume this means it applies its attack for all this, because it doesn't specify there's no problem solving card text for a card such as this. And while the attack reduction does suck, it makes it feel like a prototype for Dante, maintaining a strong 2500 defense while applying some offensive pressure. It's all ran part of a winning strategy. Elemental Hero Necroid Shaman is a level 6 Dark Fusion monster with 1900 attack, 1800 defense. This one requires Elemental Heroes Wild Heart and Necro Shade for that fusion. When special summoned, you can target a monster your opponent controls, destroy it, then special summon a monster from your opponent's grave to their side of the field. So it essentially lets you swap out a monster your opponent controls with a weaker one from their grave. And hopefully without any on summon or send to grave effects, you want to watch out for those. So they're kind of like a really passionate domestic gardener in that regard, because they really love tending to the grave yard. Elemental Hero Wild Edge is a level 8 Earth Fusion monster with 2600 attack and 2300 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Wild Heart and Blade Edge, and they can attack each monster your opponent controls once each. It's a shame it didn't also maintain the piercing damage, but I can see where a Purgatrio coming out in the early GX era might have been a bit too much power creep for the time. But no matter what else you can say about them, you can't fault their fashion sense, cause Wild Edge is looking sharp. Elemental Hero Steam Healer is a level 5 water fusion monster with 1800 attack and 1000 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Burstinatrix and Bubble Man. When they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you gain life points equal to the attack the destroyed monster has in the grave. This makes Steam Healer a kind of opposite to Flame Wingman, where that card tries to close out games, while this one is more about keeping you in them, so you don't start running out of steam. Now let's talk about some more complex fusions. These are the ones that either use more than two materials, or use another fusion monster as fusion material. Elemental Hero Tempest is a level 8 wind fusion monster with 2800 attack and defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion, Sparkman, and Bubbleman. You can send another card you control to the graveyard to target a monster you control, and while Tempest is face up on the field, that monster cannot be destroyed by battle. Curiously, it doesn't exclude itself, nor is it once per turn, so as long as you can keep sending cards, you can continue to grant semi-permanent battle destruction immunity. And that makes sense as an effect, right? Like, it's a Tempest. Have you ever tried to punch the wind? It's a lot harder than it seems. Elemental Hero Shining Flare Wing Man is a level 8 light fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Flame Wing Man and Spark Man. And a lot of their effects are going to look very similar. It retains Flame Wing Man's effect to burn your opponent for the attack of a monster it destroys in battle and sends to the grave, but along with an improved base stat line, it also gains 300 attack for each Elemental Hero card in your grave. This means, assuming the materials for Flame Wingman are still in the grave, Flare Wingman will hit the field with 3700 attack points, a boost that will really help your burn effect shine. Elemental Hero Shining Phoenix Enforcer continues the trend of similar but not quite the same monster as their predecessor. They're a level 8 fire fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Phoenix Enforcer and Sparkman. They share Flare Wingman's boost to attack for each Elemental Hero in your grave, and retains Phoenix Enforcer's immunity to battle destruction, which seems a little unnecessary since they're going to be just as beefy as Flare Wingman and even more so as the duel goes on. It looks like this card doesn't really live up to its namesake, because after burning out this hard, we never saw this particular phoenix rise from the ashes again. Elemental Hero Electrum is a level 10 light fusion monster with 2900 attack and 2600 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion, Burstinatrix, Clayman, and Bubbleman. They're also treated as Wind, Water, Fire, and Earth attribute while on the field, and when fusion summoned, you shuffle all banished cards back to their owner's deck, meaning you can immediately recycle their material if you use Miracle Fusion for them. 
Electrum also gains 300 attack for each monster your opponent controls that shares an attribute with them, so as long as it isn't a dark monster, Electrum is getting a pretty nifty attack boost. While it's had some pretty impressive showings in the anime, it's probably most well known for having its own OTK, using Fusion Gate and Chain Material to banish its Fusion Material right out of the deck, which you'll conveniently never run out of because of Electrum's own effect. Loop that a few times, utilizing some trickery involving elemental hero Gaia, and you've got a limitless supply of level 10 monsters to keep making Gustav Max, a monster you can also loop, to shell your opponent for 2,000 points of damage until you win. It's far too complicated and fragile to be worth banning, but once it's underway, it's almost impossible to overcome its Electrum might. Alright, that's it for the anime fusions, but we still have a few more main deck monsters that are here to help. For instance, we have Elemental Hero Prisma, a level 4 light monster with 1700 attack and 1000 defense. Once per turn, you can reveal a fusion monster from your extra deck, then send one of the fusion materials whose name is specifically listed on the card from your deck to the grave, all of which is cost, and once it resolves, Prisma's name becomes the sent monster's name until the end of the turn. Prisma helps you to run the absolute minimum of fusion materials you don't want to, as well as lending flexibility to the number of Elemental Hero extra deck monsters you have access to at any given time. But since it doesn't specifically have to work with Elemental Hero cards, you can splash this in all kinds of fusion decks. From my personal experience, I can remember running it in Gladiator Beasts as a way to run more copies of Bestiari to make the terrifying guy Xeris. But despite its role in helping to field these ferocious feathered fighters, Prisma is anything but a bird brain. Rottweiler is a level 3 earth machine monster with 800 attack and 1200 defense. When destroyed by battle and sent to the grave, you can target an elemental hero card and a polymerization in your grave and add both targets to your hand. Ooh, unfortunate wording on that effect means that DD Crow-like effects can snipe one and cause the whole effect to fizzle, but since this triggers during the damage step, I think it's pretty safe. It's a bit slow to be helpful in any kind of modern environment, but gosh darn it doesn't know how to play fetch. Hero Kid is a level 2 Earth Warrior monster with 300 attack and 600 defense, and when special summoned, you can special summon any number of Hero Kids from your deck, making it arguably better tribute fodder for god cards than Raw's Servant, since it doesn't put you under any kind of restriction, and you can easily summon them out of the deck with Reinforced Truth. I kid you not. But does this card have any actual ties to elemental heroes beyond the name? Well, for that, we're gonna have to start dipping into our spell and trap support. Kid Guard is a normal trap that you can activate when your opponent declares an attack. You tribute a hero kid, negate the attack, then add an elemental hero monster from your deck to your hand. So, hey, despite the stat line, this little sidekick can be good for something. Sure, it's just a glorified battle fader, but it's something. They've also got another card, Miracle Kids, which is another normal trap. This card has you targeting a monster your opponent controls, and it loses 400 attack for each hero kid in your grave until the end phase. So at least you don't need to have all these little blokes on the field to make this work, but it does assume you've done the full combo, and that's a little bit too much work for what amounts to a combat trick. Maybe try coming back in a few years, kiddo, they may have a retrain for you by then. Next, let's talk about a series of cards I like to call the Hero Flash Cycle, and you'll see why in a bit. H Heated Heart is a normal spell that has you targeting a face-up monster you control. Until the end of the turn, that monster gains 500 attack and can deal piercing battle damage. A rather innocuous card that's not very exciting on the surface, but it's been very interesting to see it be put to great use in sealed formats like the Progression Playoffs. It may not look like much, but it's got heart. If you thought that card was cool, how about E-Emergency Call? This normal spell card lets you easily search your deck for any elemental hero. With no once per turn clauses attached, it's a staple in any competitive hero deck. Now if only heroes can top an event. R Righteous Justice is a normal spell that has you destroying spell and trap cards on the field equal to the number of elemental hero cards you control. This card can trade very favorably against back row decks, especially because it doesn't target, but it does have to destroy back row equal to the heroes you have. So if your opponent doesn't have enough, you either can't activate it, or you're going to have to lose some of your own. And because it requires you to establish a field to activate, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. Generally, you want to remove back row before you start summoning, so your opponent can't interrupt you. But despite only counting elemental heroes for its effect, it's actually popular amongst all the different hero types. Destiny, Neospatians, Evil, Masked, Vision, Extra, it's a pretty righteous card. O Oversoul is a normal spell that has you targeting a normal elemental hero monster in your grave and special summoning it. It can get you fusion material, it can get you a decent blocker, and it can even summon out the massive elemental hero Neos, which can help you attack over a lot of obstacles. This all culminates in Hero Flash. It's a normal spell that has you banishing one each of H Heated Heart, E Emergency Call, 
are Righteous Justice and O Oversoul as cost. And on resolution, you special summon a normal elemental hero monster from your deck, and all normal elemental hero monsters can attack directly that turn. Our original team doesn't really amount to many attack points, so don't expect to OTK with them anytime soon. But if you can throw out a bunch of Neos, you can end the game in a flash. Fake Hero is a normal spell that special summons any elemental hero monster from your hand, but it can't attack, and is returned to the hand during the end phase. A nifty way to trigger Shadow Mist and Stratos' effects, or as a way to get heroes onto the field for more modern types of summoning like Lynx or Xyz, but not for much else since you can fusion summon using materials in your hand. Well, in most cases. Really though, I don't know why the card has to be so mean. Chaz here is trying his best, you don't have to call him fake over it. Fifth Hope is a normal spell that has you targeting 5 elemental hero monsters in your grave, and on resolution you shuffle them into your deck, then draw 2 cards. Unless you had no other cards on the field or in your hand when you activated it, in which case you draw 3. It's essentially an archetype specific pot of avarice, with a little bit of extra bubble man flavor mixed in, drawing you an extra card if you have nothing else. But now that Pot of Avarice is unbanned, what's the point of running Fifth Hope over it? Especially since Avarice can shuffle away non-elemental hero monsters. The answer to that is Disruption. If you can't return all 5 monsters with Avarice, you get nothing. But once Fifth Hope is activated, unless it's negated of course, it's going to resolve no matter what, so even if your opponent drops a DD Crow, there's still hope. Hero Heart is a normal spell that has you targeting an elemental hero monster you control, and on resolution, its attack is halved, but it can attack twice during that turn's battle phase. There aren't a lot of heroes that this can outright benefit, but if you activate Hero Heart early, any subsequent attack boost won't be halved, so it's kind of like you're doubling the bonus, something that can be a real boon to elemental hero Mariner. Now, can we please go get this knight some medical attention? Those arrows look like they hurt. Hero Mask is a normal spell that has you targeting a face-up monster you control, and on resolution, you send an elemental hero monster from your deck to the grave, and if you do, that target's name becomes the sent monster's name until the end of the turn. We've previously talked about how you can use this effect to use the elemental hero signature moves when you normally wouldn't be able to, but it also helps you to set up fusion plays like Prisma, load up your grave for O Oversoul, and can even help with contact fusion when we get to the Neos team. And if we're being honest, masks just make you look cool. We should wear them more often. Miracle Fusion is one of the most powerful cards in the hero arsenal. It's a normal spell that fusion summons an elemental hero fusion monster from your extra deck by banishing materials from your field and or grave. It's a one card fusion that gets more powerful the more times Konami decides to dip into that sweet, sweet nostalgia barrel. It's a miracle this card hasn't already jumped the shark. Skyscraper is a field spell that has an effect which triggers if your elemental hero monster attacks a monster with a higher attack stat, and grants that hero a 1000 attack boost for that damage calculation only. While it's not going to have your back on the defensive, this can help you get over monsters you normally couldn't otherwise. Even the simple Sparkman can grow to an impressive 2600 attack, so with a field spell like this, the sky's the limit. And not to be outdone by the Art Deco cityscape, Skyscraper 2 Hero City is here to usher in some sci-fi style sensibilities. It's a field spell that has an effect you can activate during your main phase, targeting any elemental hero in your grave that was destroyed by battle and special summoning it. It doesn't even ask that it was destroyed in battle that turn, so as long as you can remember which monsters were destroyed by what, you can always activate Hero City later on in the duel to scoop up an appropriate monster. However, its limited activation timing and limited conditions for what can be revived means that if you're considering playing this card, you really are scraping the bottom of the barrel. Change of Hero Reflector Ray is a normal trap that activates whenever one of your elemental hero fusion monsters is destroyed by battle and sent to the grave. When it resolves, you burn your opponent for 300 points of damage times the fusion monster's level. It makes for a funny final up yours moment for when your opponent runs over your boss monster, but they've really got to get their direction together when it comes to their card art. Sparkman's in there for crying out loud, you can't activate that effect off of his destruction, come on! Elemental Recharge is a normal trap that gives you a thousand life points for each face-up elemental hero monster you control. There aren't very many cards in Heroes that have you spending life points for anything, so it's not like you need it to counteract anything more than a hero lives, but even so, hero work is very stressful. Sometimes you just have to take a bit of time to recharge. Hero Barrier is a normal trap that can negate an attack from an opponent's monster, but you must control a face-up elemental hero monster to resolve the effect. This is... This is just bad. You could be playing Negate Attack, which is a counter trap and stops the whole battle phase and doesn't require you to have a specific monster, or Battle Fader, which doesn't even minus you. 
and none of them are even that expensive, so when it comes to attack negation, there really is no barrier to entry. Hero Blast is a normal trap that I have very, very painful memories of. It targets a normal elemental hero monster in your grave, adds it to your hand, then if your opponent controls any monsters with attack less than or equal to the elemental hero you scooped up, you can destroy one of them. An infamous part of old hero beat deck lists, you can return elemental hero Neos Alias, an eligible target because it's a Gemini, then blast just about any normal summon in the game while setting it back up to run the field on your next normal summon. I can't tell you the number of noble Laquari that gave their lives because of this loathsome card. I certainly didn't feel like much of a beast after it resolved. Hero Counterattack is a normal trap that activates when an elemental hero monster you control is destroyed in battle. When it resolves, your opponent picks a random card from your hand, and if it's an elemental hero, you destroy one monster your opponent controls, then special summon the revealed hero. This means that the smaller your hand is, the more likely this card is to be effective, provided you actually have a hero in your hand. It's still just about as useful as all of our other effects that only trigger on battle destruction, but it would have been funny if this counter-attack was a counter-trap. Hero Signal is a normal trap that activates when a monster you control is destroyed by battle and sent to the grave. When it resolves, you special summon a level 4 or lower elemental hero from your hand or deck. It's cool that it doesn't restrict what kind of monster has to be destroyed, so it will still work with previously mentioned cards like Rockweiler and Hero Kit. And as we get more elemental heroes, the more good targets we can get for it. But it's still a card that's too slow that does too little to be effective. In fact, it's cards like this that really signal to us what bad card design looks like. Hero Spirit is a normal trap that you can activate if an elemental hero monster you control was destroyed by battle that turn, and it makes the battle damage from one of your opponent's monsters zero. Wow, this is... where do I start? This card just boggles my mind. It stops battle damage, but only once, and you have to lose a hero to make it active. And nothing on this card looks even remotely like a hero. I would be willing to write this off as just another usage of the regular form hero name like with Hero Metal, but it name drops elemental heroes in its effect. You know, I'm starting to think that the designers weren't really getting into the spirit of things. Magistry Alchemist is a fairly new card that isn't technically specific to elemental heroes, but it's got Electrum in the art, it has a scene from the anime, and it cares about having a lot of different attributes, so I'm making the executive decision to add it here. You banish four hero monsters from your grave and or face upon the field, then target a hero monster in your grave and special summon it, ignoring its summoning conditions. Also, if you banished Earth, Water, Fire, and Wind attributes to activate the effect, which is in line with the four attributes of Electrum's fusion material, the monster you summon has its attack doubled, and you permanently negate the effects of all face-up cards your opponent currently controls. So at worst, it revives any hero by banishing four others, and at best it's an Ice Beast Zero Fine and a Mega Morph on top of everything else. It's a game-ending card, and if we get to a point where we're shoving a ton of different hero attributes into the grave instead of just a bunch of darks, then this card can help light the way to victory. Mirror Gate is a normal trap that activates when an opponent's monster declares an attack, targeting a face-up elemental hero monster you control. Once it resolves, you switch control of the two monsters involved in the battle, then resolve that battle. Control of both monsters changes back during the end phase. This one's a legitimately funny card, essentially swapping who takes the damage but does little else. However, you do get to keep your opponent's monster until the end phase, so if you have anything that can get rid of it while you control it, perhaps by attributing it to activate an effect, then your opponent's not gonna get it back. It's that kind of play sequence that will reflect well on you as a duelist. Part 2 the manga. This section will talk about cards that are exclusive to the manga, or cards that are closely related to them. For those of you that don't know, GX's story is actually quite different from the animes, introducing such cards and concepts as Tragodia and the Legendary Planets. And speaking of different timelines, some of these cards also make an appearance in the Zexel manga, used by a minor antagonist known as Fusion Mask, so that was a pretty neat piece of trivia to run into. Elemental Hero Flash is a level 4 light monster with 1100 attack and 1600 defense. When destroyed by battle and sent to the grave, you can banish Flash and three other Elemental Hero monster cards from your grave to target a normal spell in your grave and add it to your hand. Now that does seem pretty costly and situational, but a normal spell usually means a fusion spell, and with all the cards we'll be banishing, it works insanely well with Parallel World Fusion, which we'll get into in a bit. In fact, you could say that it works shockingly well. 
Elemental Hero Voltic is a level 4 light thunder monster with 1000 attack and 1500 defense. And when it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can target one of your banished elemental heroes and special summon them. This works well with Flash and Miracle Fusion, banishing heroes for you to summon with Voltic's effect. The issue will be getting in for any of that battle damage. Seriously, why did they give it an effect dependent on dealing damage, then only make it as strong as Avion? Your opponent's barely gonna feel a jolt, much less a bolt. Elemental Hero Heat is a level 4 fire pyro monster with 1600 attack and 1200 defense. And they gain 200 attack for each Elemental Hero monster you control, so it immediately goes up to 1800 all on its own. It's a solid attacker that gets bigger the more you swarm the field, so when you go wide, Heat's gonna have your opponent sweating bullets. And in the heteronormative primitive superhero tradition, we also the, got the girl version of Heat, Elemental Hero Lady Heat. Feel on the nose there, don't you think? Anyway, there is a level 4 Fire Pyro monster with 1300 attack and 1000 defense, and during each of your end phases, you burn your opponent for 200 points of damage for each phase of Elemental Hero monster you control. Once again, we have an effect that rewards you for swarming the field with heroes, doing a pretty sizable amount of damage with an established field. Trigger it enough times and it's your opponent who will go out in the blaze of glory. Elemental Hero Ice Edge is a level 3 water monster with 800 attack and 900 defense. Once per turn during your main phase 1, you can discard a card to allow Ice Edge to attack directly that turn. And when they inflict battle damage specifically by a direct attack, you can target a set card in your opponent's spell and trap zone and destroy it. So you discard a card, essentially do 800 points of damage, and if your opponent has a face down card in their spell and trap zone, and if they don't activate it in response to your attack, you get to pop it. Yeah, if Ice Edge calls, just tell them I'm not here. I have no problem giving them the cold shoulder. Elemental Hero Knospa is a level 3 earth plant monster with 600 attack, 1000 defense. While you control another elemental hero monster, your opponent can't target Knospa with attacks, and this little flower buddy can attack directly. Also, each time they deal battle damage to your opponent, they gain 100 attack and lose 100 defense, so it's kind of like they're growing out of their seed as they get in for more attacks. That's pretty neat. It's a shame their stat line starts off so low, but I can relate. I mean, who hasn't felt like a late bloomer before? I think I had to kill at least four people before I got the attack I wanted personally. They've also got kind of a Neo Bubble Man thing going on, where you can use a particular spell to unlock a new form, and that spell is Rosebud. It's a simple normal spell. You tribute an Elemental Hero Nospi to special summon an Elemental Hero Poison Rose from your hand or deck. Just make sure you don't play this card if you haven't seen Citizen Kane yet. I hear it's very important to the plot. But what about the card that Lil Nost goes into? Elemental Hero Poison Rose is a level 6 earth plant monster of 1900 attack and 2000 defense. They cannot be normal summoned or set and must be special summoned by the effect of Rosebud and not by any other way. It also maintains the Nost effect where whenever they deal battle damage, Poison Rose gains 200 attack and loses 200 defense. They don't maintain the ability to attack directly like their younger self, but where Nost would hide behind the other heroes to avoid being targeted for attacks. Poison Rose rushes into the front lines and is the only monster your opponent can target for attacks. And depending on the setup, this means they could be a real thorn in your opponent's side. Elemental Hero Woodsman is a level 4 earth monster with 1000 attack and 2000 defense. Once per turn during your standby phase, you can add a polymerization from your deck or grave to your hand. Woodsman is... frustrating. You can't normal summon it and expect it to survive because you know, a thousand attack, and you can't set it and expect the effect to trigger by your next standby phase, because your opponent has to attack into Woodsman, and it has to survive, so... Yeah, it's a shame, but their effect really does go against the grain. Elemental Hero Ocean is a level 4 water monster with 1500 attack and 1200 defense, and a good heart. And that's what's most important. Once per turn, also during your standby phase, you can target a hero monster you control or in your graveyard and return that target to the hand. Woodsman and Ocean work together to keep your resources stocked up, so it's a kind of a shame it takes such a long time to trigger the effects to do that. I mean, if you can protect them for a while, you can recycle a bunch of cool stuff like combo pieces and extenders, but getting there can be a little slippery. It's funny because he's water. Elemental Hero Stratos is a level 4 wind monster with 1800 attack and 300 defense, and when it's normal or special summoned you can activate one of two effects. You can either destroy spells and traps on the field up to the number of other hero monsters you control, or you can add any hero monster from your deck to your hand. 
Here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, the elemental hero that's been on the ban list for untold generations. My father was told by my grandfather about the horrors of Airblade Turbo, but now that Power Creep has set in and abusing Phoenix Blade is just a thing we do now, he flies with us once again, carrying heroes to and fro and blowing up back row when we're already far, far ahead in the game. Top this off with any lack of ones per turn restriction, and you've got one of the major reasons why heroes really are just a few well-placed pieces of support away from a high tier status, giving this fan favourite deck a second wind. Elemental Hero Shadow Mist is a level 4 dark monster with 1000 attack and 1500 defense, and if they're special summoned, you can add one change quick play spell from your deck to your hand. Also, if they're sent to the grave, you can add any hero monster from your deck to your hand, except another copy of itself, but you can only use one effect per turn, and only once per turn. Now, while Shadow Mist was introduced in the manga, it was a normal monster there, so it bears little resemblance to the card we know today. This would be Stratos' replacement until the Winged Warrior came off the Forbidden and Limited list, and it would be a bridge to a whole new way to play heroes. But we'll get to Masked Heroes and their associated change cards later on. For elemental hero purposes, they're a great way to maintain card advantage after being used as material, and ensure that your combo pieces won't be missed. But how do we use Shadow Mist as fusion material? All the elemental hero fusion monsters so far have had specifically listed material, and Shadow Mist wasn't on any of them. Well, that's where our next cycle of heroes comes in. Colloquially known as Omni Heroes, these six fusions require any elemental hero, plus a monster of its associated attribute. Not only does this make gathering fusion material much easier by broadening the number of useful cards, they have a variety of outstanding effects at their disposal. Elemental Hero Absolute Zero is a level 8 water fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, requiring any hero monster and a water monster. They gain 500 attack for every monster on the field, except itself, and if they leave the field by any means, you can destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Weirdly enough, this is the only Omni hero that doesn't need an elemental hero as a material, just a hero. While not extraordinarily powerful on its own, Absolute Zero is a tricky landmine to play around forcing your opponents to remove it before committing to a board, lest it be completely undone, and that's if you don't already have a way to remove them from the field on your own accord. So make no mistake, despite the name, this hero is no Zero. Elemental Hero Eskuri Dao was a level 8 dark fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, requiring any elemental hero monster and a dark monster, and it gains 100 attack for each elemental hero monster in your grave. As a card, Eskuri Dao is nothing special, you'll have trouble getting over 3000 with those kind of gains, but it's more about the options that the Omni heroes present to you. Super Polymerization Dark is one of the most represented attributes in the game, so despite being very bland, it lets you out cards like Red Eyes Dark Dragoon without a care in the world, and that's just super. Elemental Hero Gaia is a level 8 earth fusion monster with 2200 attack and 2600 defense, requiring any elemental hero monster and an earth monster. When fusion summoned, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls, and until the end phase, that monster's attack is halved, while Gaia gains that much attack. This means that if it can be targeted, Gaia can sap its power, kind of like a metal morph, and swing in for 2200 points of damage while clearing a big threat, proving that Gaia is willing to move mountains to help you win games. Elemental Hero Great Tornado is a level 8 wind fusion monster with 2800 attack and 2200 defense, requiring any elemental hero monster and a wind monster. If they're fusion summoned, you have the attack and defense of all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls. So whereas Gaia excels at taking out single monsters, Great Tornado can cripple an entire lineup of them, helping your army of heroes run over your opponents with no time limit on how long the stat reduction lasts. Or if you're feeling cheeky, you can fusion summon them at quick effect speed with any number of effects at the beginning of your opponent's battle phase to blunt a particularly dangerous offensive push, blowing your opponent's plans off course. Elemental Hero Nova Master is a level 8 fire fusion monster with 2600 attack and 2100 defense, requiring any elemental hero monster and a fire monster. If they destroy a monster by battle, you get to draw a card. That's probably one of the most straightforward fusions in the entire theme, but really, who cares? You get to draw a card for beating up your opponent's monsters. Also, funny note, this is the only Omni hero that isn't in the manga, and we'll get into why that is in a bit. For now, all you have to know is that this is a great card. You may be thinking I'm glossing over how weak their effect is nowadays because of their extremely awesome name, but I assure you I am completely unbiased when it comes to cards of the Nova archetype. Elemental Hero The Shining 
Level 8 Light Fusion Monster with 2600 attack and 2100 defense. Requiring any elemental hero monster and a light monster. Pretty easy requirements there. They gain 300 attack for each of your banished elemental hero monsters, and when it's set from the field of the grave, you target up to two of those banished elemental hero monsters and add them right to your hand. This is another really strong tempo card that fit right in with Hero Beat. I mean, by using Miracle Fusion, you could make a Shining with 3200 attack right off the bat. That's ginormous. And if you ever managed to get over it, your opponent was liable to get back the Neos Alias they use as material, allowing them to retake the board with ease. It's a really annoying card to deal with, but I guess that's what you get when you let Kubrick design a card. The next few fusions don't really fall into a specific category, so these are just the rest of the manga fusions. Elemental Hero Inferno was a level 8 fire pyro fusion monster with 2300 attack and 1600 defense, requiring Elemental Hero's Heat and Lady Heat as material, and if they do battle with a water monster, they gain 1000 attack during damage calculation only. Now, this card right here is the Fire Omni Hero in the manga, but since they printed its material as Heat and Lady Heat, they had to make a whole new Omni Hero to complete the cycle in paper, and thank goodness they did. Having your only effect be an attack boost against a specific attribute is a quick way to get you flamed in the comments. Elemental Hero Terra Firma is a level 8 Earth Fusion Monster with 2,500 attack and 2,000 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Ocean and Woodsman, and is one of the legendary planet cards we talked about earlier. They contribute any face-up Elemental Hero Monster, and Terra Firma gains attack equal to the tributed monster's attack until the end phase. So if you just need a little extra boost to get through a big monster, Terra Firma can team up with your other heroes to put together an Earth Shattering Blow. Elemental Hero Core is a level 9 Earth Fusion monster with 2700 attack and 2200 defense, requiring any three Elemental Hero monsters as material. Once per turn, when targeted for an attack, you can double Core's attack until the end of the damage step. Also, at the end of a battle phase in which it battled, you can target a monster on the field and destroy it. Also, when they're destroyed by battle or card effect, you can target a level 8 or lower Elemental Hero Fusion monster in your grave and special summon it, ignoring summoning conditions. This is a pretty spiffy monster to sink material into if you have the resources. Monsters that can attack and blow stuff up while doing so make for great ways to continuously apply pressure to your opponent. They also can just run in to it, as 5400 attack is a tough amount to get over, and if they do remove it, you can get back any number of your powerful hero fusions. In fact, I would argue that if its fusion material cost wasn't so steep, it'd be the core of your strategy. Contrast Hero Chaos is a level 9 dark fusion monster with 3000 attack and 2600 defense, requiring any two masked heroes as material, and is always treated as an elemental hero. So that's how it found its way onto this particular list. While face up on the field, it is also treated as a light monster, and once per turn as a quick effect, you can target a face up card on the field and negate that target's effects until the end of the turn. This card is as cool as it is elusive. An effect like this is basically just blanket negation for anything that hits the board, including normal spells and traps, and even has the ability to bypass chain blocks if the intended target is on the field. Combine that with an impressive 3000 attack, and you have the makings of a powerful boss that can anchor a board and help it weather any storm your opponent throws at you. Except for its ridiculous fusion materials. At the time of writing, none of the masked hero main deck monsters from the manga have been released. So the only way to get the fusion material is to pull it out of the extra deck. And if you're gonna go through all the trouble of summoning masked heroes in the first place, you don't wanna just give them up. But mark my words, once we get main deck masked heroes, this monster's gonna cause a whole other buyout of hero strike structure decks all by itself. Causing a whole lot of... chaos. Now it's time for the support cards introduced in the manga. A Hero Lives is a normal spell you can activate if you control no face-up monsters. You pay half your life points, and on resolution, you special summon a level 4 or lower elemental hero monster from your deck. An excellent way to start your plays, it grabs you an extender to start off on the right foot. You can summon Shadow Mist to get a sweet change quick play spell, or Stratos for another search. Just be careful about the life point cost. If you don't keep up a good defense after that, then a hero isn't going to be living for much longer. Hero's Bond is a normal spell that you can activate if there's a face-up hero monster on the field. On resolution, you special summon two level 4 or lower elemental heroes from your hand. Well, if you're looking for a Link or Xyz spam version of the deck, this is certainly a way to do it, but considering the fusion play style it focuses on, I just don't think it bonds very well with the rest of it. 
Legacy of a Hero is a normal spell that has you returning any two fusion monsters from your grave to your extra deck that list a hero monster as material, and on resolution, you draw three cards. Good grief, a plus two pot of avarice with no chance of disruption outside of hard negation that recycles some of your best payoffs? I can see why this doesn't see a lot of play, the returning cost is very, very narrow, so not only does it require setup, but a very specific setup. Though, if this card's legacy is to incentivize the creation of Dogmatica heroes, I'm I'm all for it. Parallel World Fusion is a normal spell that's kind of the opposite of Miracle Fusion. You fusion summon an elemental hero fusion monster from your extra deck by shuffling banished materials into your deck, but you are locked out of special summoning any other monsters that turn, before or after. The last part really sours the effect, because it's just a great way to get back resources and field a powerful monster, but we need to be summoning a lot of monsters in a single turn, and we have plenty of other ways to recycle our banished cards nowadays. Although, with recent advancements in fusion research, you could use it with Verte Anaconda to utilize it later in the turn. And combined with its first effect to change monsters to Dark Attribute, this could be your gateway to the Gritty Reboot Dimension. Terra Firma Gravity is a normal trap you can activate during your opponent's battle phase as long as you control elemental hero Terra Firma. That turn, all level 4 or lower monsters your opponent controls that can attack Terra Firma must do so, and cannot attack otherwise. So, if you're fighting against a deck with a lot of low-level monsters, this is a way to force them to make some very unfavorable plays, but... Well, you're gonna have to find a very specific meta where this is going to be effective for you. And if you like this card, I hope you don't think I'm being too discouraging, but I do want the advice that I give you to be down to earth. Part 3, Legacy. This section will cover the remainder of the elemental hero cards that don't have any representation in the anime or manga. These cards will either be elemental heroes, or focus specifically on elemental heroes, with anything more generic than that showing up in the last issue of this series. Elemental Hero Captain Gold is a level 4 light monster with 2100 attack and 800 defense, and you can discard them to add the original Skyscraper from your deck to your hand. Also, if they're on the field and Skyscraper isn't, Captain Gold is destroyed. It seems so weird that Captain Gold isn't in the anime, but I couldn't find a single appearance in the entire show. Which is a huge shame, because personally, as someone who gets the fashion of gold, they would have looked stunning. Elemental Hero Blaze Man is a level 4 fire monster with 1200 attack and 1800 defense. If normal or special summoned, you can add polymerization from your deck to your hand. Or, during your main phase, you can send any other hero monster from your main deck to the grave. Except another Blaze Man, of course. And if you do, he copies that monster's stat spread and attribute. However, if you do do that, you're restricted to only special summons through fusion summon from the rest of the turn. And, well, you only get one of those effects per turn, once per turn. While initially a pretty fun card to play around with, unfortunately Blazeman kind of got paved over really quickly by Vion soon after his introduction, since it basically did all these things but faster, better, stronger. Still though, you gotta give him some credit for being the first to do it, and hell, he works just fine if you want a more fun, casual, pure e-hero Jaden Yuki-esque build. Gee, I wonder if I know anyone who's like that. Maybe a certain handsome Slifer Red student that you could like and subscribe. Elemental Hero Solid Soldier is a level 4 earth monster with 1300 attack and 1100 defense, and when normal summoned, you can special summon one level 4 or lower hero monster from your hand. Also, if they're sent from the monster zone to the grave by a spell effect, perhaps by way of fusion summoning, you can target a hero in your grave, except another copy of itself, and special summon it in defense position. This card has effectively replaced Goblinburg as the premier way to trigger Shadow Mist's change spell search effect, as well as being able to summon Stratos for more searching. And from that point, you can either use them as fusion material to recycle a hero, turn them into a Link 2, or overlay them if you have room for a Rank 4 toolbox. What can I say? This monster is just really solid. Elemental Hero Liquid Soldier is a level 4 water monster with 1400 attack and 1300 defense, and when normal summoned, you can target a level 4 or lower hero monster in your grave, except another copy of itself, and special summon it. Also, if Liquid Soldier is used as material for a fusion summon of a hero monster and sent to the grave or banished, you can draw two cards, then discard one, and you can only use one effective Liquid Soldier per turn, and only once per turn. Liquid serves a very similar role as Solid, summoning out your heroes with on-summon triggers, but Solid is better at deploying them in the early game, while Liquid can pull from your ever-growing graveyard to get its targets, and the fact that it provides card advantage even if used as material with Miracle Fusion is bonkers. It also gives me an excuse to make Metal Gear Solid references whenever I'm playing them, and that's a whole reward in and of itself. 
Now, this one's a signature move spell, specifically for Flame Wingman, but since it's generic in application, it's going in this section. Skydive Scorcher is a normal spell that has you targeting an elemental hero fusion monster you control. On resolution, you destroy as many monsters your opponent controls as possible with attack higher than your targeted monster, then burn your opponent for damage equal to the highest original attack in the grave of the monsters destroyed by this effect. However, if you have a Skyscraper Field spell in your field zone, uh, either one will work here, you burn them for the combined total of those monsters' original attack in the grave. That's some pretty spicy removal, especially since it's completely at odds with the attack boosting effect of modern heroes. Dread Decimator, Sunrise, Malicious Bane, everything is getting boosted to high heaven, so it's almost impossible to trigger this card effectively. But if you were to use one of the older heroes, which generally have pretty low attack, and you assume that you are that player that is running Skyscraper, you could say that Skydive Scorcher was made specifically as a high roll card for hero decks that are built more to be true to the anime than a modern meta. And honestly, that's lovely card design. Somewhere, there's a Dragonlink player, pose in their hair saying, well Zounds, there's no way this hero player could defeat me, I have a field of untargetable monsters. Only to meet their end by an instant fusion summoned elemental hero Mariner with Skydive Scorcher and Skyscraper. And that, my friends, is beautiful. Elemental Hero Grand Merge is a level 6 light fusion monster with zero attack and defense who requires two normal hero monsters materials. It does gain attack and defense equal to the combined level of its materials times 300, but his real power is the second effect. You see, Grand Merge is a gateway to all hero fusion monsters, since when it destroys a monster by battle, it can special summon any elemental hero fusion monster from the extra deck ignoring the summoning condition at a measly cost of tributing itself. The downside to this effect is the inability to attack monsters of an equal or lower level, but neither Xyz nor Lynx have those, so... There are many interesting monsters Grand Marriage can summon. Just make sure that what you want doesn't have an effect that's tied to actually being fusion summoned, because that's not going to trigger. Although, if an effect triggers on being special summoned from the extra deck, that's fair game. Other than this little thing, this card is grand. Elemental Hero Sunrise is a level 7 light fusion monster with 2500 attack and 1200 defense, requiring any two hero monsters with different attributes. It grants all of your monsters a 200 attack boost for every attribute among monsters you control, and has two effects with hard ones per turn clauses. If special summoned, you can add a miracle fusion from your deck to your hand, and when an attack is declared involving a hero monster you control, you can target a card on the field and destroy it. Sunrise is an absolutely fantastic card that does almost anything you could want for the theme. Save for some more broad negation. It bolsters your team, extends your fusion plays, and acts as removal for just about anything. Heroes may have gone through a bit of a renaissance with recent support from other subsections of the theme, but I truly feel that Sunrise is the one that will herald in the dawn of a new era for heroes. Issue number two, Destiny. Destiny heroes are piloted by the pro-playing polymath Aster Phoenix, at least in the anime. Not only is he a dueling prodigy, but excels in basically every field he touches, from athletics to more conventional academics. Aster is basically the Bruce Wayne of the dueling world, which is appropriate considering his deck of choice. The Destiny heroes are an interesting mix of darker comic book characters, you know, your spawns and the like, but also British figures of fiction like Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, and the Man in the Iron Mask. I have no idea why the designers decided to lean in so heavily into that mythology, but it's the kind of weird, out of left field energy that keeps me coming back. Like the previous issue, we're going to split this into a few sections, as we've got some very distinct eras of Destiny heroes that we really should look at in chronological order. So without further ado, or without further Edo if you'll allow the pun, let's move on to part 1, GX. Point of order, all Destiny heroes are dark attribute warrior type monsters, a stark contrast to the elemental heroes, who dipped into the attribute very rarely. We're also going to be covering cards that may have had a print release long after their anime debut, but we're going to mention them here because they still originated there. Destiny hero Doomlord is a level 3 monster with 600 attack and 800 defense, and once per turn you can target a monster your opponent controls and banish it, however it's returned to the field in the same battle position during your second standby phase after activation, and you can't declare an attack with any monster monster the turn you activate this effect. Also, Doomlord has to be in face-up attack position to activate and resolve the effect. 
Oh, this condition is so annoying. Not only does it have to stay on the field to resolve, meaning that cards like Book of Moon are effectively negation, it has to be an attack position where you know it's going to get run over by just about anything. It does have some interesting applications. It can shed any Ixyz monster of its material, and if a monster has to be in the extra monster zone, this is a neat way to get them out of there. But combined with the fact that it just shuts out your battle phase, and we've got some card design that was doomed to fail. Destiny Hero Diamond Dude is a level 4 monster with 1400 attack and 1600 defense. And once per turn, you can excavate the top card of your deck, and if it's a normal spell, send it to the grave, and if it's anything else, it goes to the bottom of your deck. During either main phase of your next turn, you can activate the effect of that spell in your graveyard, even if you no longer control Diamond Dude. This is... One of the strangest pieces of card design in the game, and the amount of weird corner cases it causes is probably the reason why we don't see more cards like it. Let me rattle off a few for you. 1. If you activate the effect of a normal spell with any kind of cost, you don't pay it, because you're only copying the effect. 2. If you flip over a spell with a hard once per turn activation limit, Lightning Storm for example, you can activate both a regular copy and the Diamond Dude version in the same turn. Because the disembodied effect made manifest by our Destiny hero technically has no name to be limited by. And third, your opponent can chain to the activation of this weird phantom effect, but if they're thinking of negating it, make sure you check the fine print. If it has to be chained to a spell card activation to negate, then they're out of luck. They'll have to come back later with something that stops spell effects. And I'm sure there are many, many more strange scenarios out there, so just like the diamonds found on this particular dude, this card has many facets. Destiny Hero Captain Tenacious is a level 3 monster with 800 attack and defense, and once per turn during your standby phase, you can target a Destiny Hero in your grave that was destroyed by battle since your last standby phase, if you controlled Tenacious when that monster was destroyed, and special summon it. It's incredible, they give these monsters such wildly powerful and useful effects, but they couldn't manage a few extra attack points? Oh well, I guess that's what Power Creep is for. But before we wrap up this section, I have to talk about what I found on the Yugi Wiki about this card. Apparently, Captain Tenacious is a reference to the greatest rock band of all time, Tenacious D, and the supporting evidence for that is the English dub name of Aster's Legal Guardian. See, Aster's dad was kidnapped while he was a kid, and the guy who murdered his dad ended up looking after Aster to avoid being suspected for the murder of Mr. Phoenix in a really convoluted way. Now, this man goes by the D because no one in the localization department could have foreseen how funny that would become, but their real name is Kyle Jables, which combines the names of the two members of Tenacious D, Kyle Gass and Jack Black, or as he's often referred to as... Jables. I couldn't possibly make a joke to cap this off that surpasses that knowledge. It's incredible. Destiny Hero Blade Master is a level 3 monster with 300 attack and 600 defense, and during your opponent's battle phase, you can discard Blade Master to give all your face-up Destiny Heroes you control an 800 attack boost until the end phase. This card is so close to being good. It's nice that you can trick your opponent into attacking a weak Destiny Hero, only to make their attack skyrocket at the last second, but imagine if you could use this proactively. In fact, this is something that you'll see across a lot of cards in the early hero pool. Design choices that would be pushed in later sets, almost as if these cards were a kind of testing ground. For instance, Blade Master is kind of like a more restricted Kalut, but I'd be careful about how you phrase it to them, because these monsters definitely keep the I studied the blade copy posture ready to go at moments like this. Destiny Hero Dasher is a level 6 monster with 2100 attack and 1000 defense. Once per turn, you contribute another monster you control, and Dasher gains 1000 attack until the end of the turn. And you probably should, because if Dasher attacks, it's changed to defense position at the end of the battle phase, Dante style. Also, one time only, while Dasher is in your grave when you draw a monster card during your draw phase, you can reveal it to special summon it but Dasher must be in the grave to activate and resolve the effect. This is another weird one. I don't think there's another card quite like it, but it does make for a heck of a nail biter. They're an effective attacker if needed, but more importantly makes each one of your top decks relevant, especially considering a game-changing spell card we'll get into later. Just another good reason to always leave a good review and tip for your Dasher. Destiny Hero Defender is a level 4 monster with 100 attack and 2700 defense. That's pretty strong for just a normal set although it pays for that defensive strength with a great weakness. During each of your opponent's standby phases, they would get to draw a card so long as Defender was in face-up defense position. Quite the drawback, and while it may seem atrocious in modern day, 
it actually wasn't too unreasonable back when it was released. If you were to set it and your opponent attacked into it carelessly, that would often take a chunk of damage, and they wouldn't even get the chance to draw the card the defender would give them. Then, if you had a tribute summon monster, like a monarch, you could just tribute defender away and get something with more offensive capability. He may have been destined to be fodder, but it's a defender I'd want in my corner. Destiny Hero Double Dude is a level 6 monster with 1000 attack and defense and cannot be special summoned. Double Dude can attack twice during each battle phase, and during your standby phase, if they were destroyed since your last standby phase, you can special summon two Double Dude tokens, each with the same stats as the original Double Dude, but they have to stay in the grave to activate and resolve the effect. Kinda of bites that you have to tribute summon for such a small attacker, but that means any attack boost is effectively doubled, and replacing themselves with two tokens will be really nice for some other cards we have. Or Heck, just for Link Summoning in general. I also like how it doesn't specify where it has to be destroyed from, so if you have something that has a Fire King-esque effect that destroys cards in your hand, then you can still get the benefit without having to put them on the field. So if you stack the tokens with whatever other value you're getting from that effect, you'll be doubling your investment. Destiny Hero Fearmonger is a level 4 monster with 1000 attack and defense, and during your standby phase, if this card is in your grave because it was destroyed by battle and sent to the grave since your last standby phase, you target a Destiny Hero monster in your grave except a copy of itself and special summon it. So they float, it just takes a really long time which is kind of a theme for the archetype. A lot of your payoffs have a long delay until they resolve, and there's nothing wrong with that in theory, but you'd think the payoff would be a bit stronger than just summoning a single Destiny hero. If you're looking for cards with a quicker pace to keep up with the modern meta, I fear you'll have to look elsewhere. Destiny Hero Malicious is a level 6 monster with 800 attack and defense, and you can banish them from your grave to summon another copy of themselves from the deck. It's a single line of text, and it's had an impact that's rippled through the game ever since. The simple ability to replace themselves with no strings attached has been exploited to break every extra deck summoning mechanic since Synchro, causing it to bounce all across the Forbidden and Limited list. It made for outstanding Synchro material, provides easier access to the rank 6 pool, and helps you climb the link ladder like you wouldn't believe. In fact, it's so good that hero decks are made actively worse because of it, since it's currently sitting on the semi-limited list for its broad applications, so the deck that it's meant to work with can't access its full potential, which it badly needs. Sorry, I know it's a harsh measure, but I hope you know we don't have any malicious intent. Destiny Hero Disc Commander is a level 1 monster with 300 attack and defense, and they have a storied history. Originally, when special summoned from the grave, you just drew two cards, which is absolutely wild. So before they brought it back from the ban list, they slapped it with a huge errata, making it so it can't be special summoned from the grave the turn it was sent there, and the effect can only be activated once per duel. I mean, I'm glad it was taken away. Turning any revival effect into two draws is ridiculous, and has gotten even more ridiculous as the games progressed. But with a change like that, then what was even the point? To combo with Fusion Destiny and Dominance? I mean, sure, I guess, but you'll have a hard time getting the player base to buy into that spin. Destiny Hero Departed is a level 2 monster with 1000 attack and 0 defense, and during your standby phase, if Departed is in your grave, special summon it in face-up attack position to your opponent's side of the field. And if it would be destroyed by battle or sent to the grave from your hand or deck by a card effect, it gets banished. Can Destiny Heroes have, like, a single monster that doesn't have an effect that's completely off the walls? You're gonna have to send Departed to Grave in very specific ways to keep it from being banished, discarding as cost works, as well as using it as fusion material while on the field specifically. Departed can make a hole in your opponent's defensive line that you can punch through, or if you have some kind of effect that would benefit from destroying an opponent's monster over and over again, but aside from that, I don't really feel like it fits our department. Destiny Hero Dunker is a level 4 monster with 1200 attack and 1700 defense, and you can send a Destiny Hero card from your hand to the grave to inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent. Hey look, a way to get departed into the grave, that's neat. In fact, this rather innocuous amount of burn has a lot of synergy with other cards we've talked about so far, namely Malicious and Dasher. Destiny Draw does replace the cards, but you'll need a copy for each one you want to discard. Dunker, by comparison, does not have a once per turn clause, so they have no such restrictions. However, history has shown that only one of these two ended up being competitively relevant, so don't expect to dunk on your opponent with this monster. D cubed is a level 1 Dark Machine monster at zero attack and defense, and it's likely supposed to be the Destiny Hero version of Watt Rider. If normal summoned, it's treated as a Destiny Hero monster while face up on the field. 
If destroyed by battle or card effect, you could send a Destiny Hero monster from your deck to the grave. And once per turn, you can discard up to two cards to special summon any number of D cubes equal to what you discard from your hand, deck, or grave. However, this does keep you from normal or special summoning for the rest of the turn, except to summon Destiny Hero monsters. This card was designed to help you get Destiny Heroes Dogma and Plasma onto the field, and if they get destroyed, you can send any of your Destiny Heroes with good grave effects. Of course, if you leave this out to get destroyed, that does make you a complete monster. Look at this little robot friend, how could you ever put them in danger? Destiny Hero Celestial is a level 4 monster with 1600 attack and 1400 defense. When they declare an attack, you can target a phase-up spell your opponent controls and destroy it, and if you do, inflict 500 points of damage to your opponent. While you have no cards in your hand, you can banish Celestial and one other Destiny Hero monster in your grave to draw two cards, but you can't use that effect the turn it's been sent to the grave. So hey, another draw engine to go along with Destiny Draw. Heck, it even makes for a great card to pitch for the spell to set up even more draws. And... Yeah, I guess you also have a way to pop field spells and other such cards now in the theme. It's a great way to help you get back into the game if you're behind, or you just have an empty hand and want to draw some more cards, with some extra utility that's simply heavenly. And speaking of angelic imagery, Destiny Hero Dark Angel is a level 1 monster with zero attack and defense. If you have three or more Destiny Heroes in your grave, you can discard them, then target a Destiny Hero in your grave and special summon it to your opponent's field in defense position. When a spell card or effect you activate resolves, negate that effect and if you do, or if it did not have an effect, Dark Angel is destroyed. During your standby phase, you can banish Dark Angel and another Destiny Hero monster in your grave, and each player chooses a normal spell from their deck and places it on top of their deck. Okay, what is going on with this card? Well, in the anime, Plasma works a bit differently. You need to have a card called D-Force on top of your deck face up to turn on the effect negation, as well as making Plasma unaffected by opposing spell and trap effects. This makes Plasma almost impossible to get over, as merely activating D-Force puts it on top of your deck face up and stops your draw phase, so it's pretty much stuck there. Dark Angel's anime effect was used by Aster to put itself on top of the D's deck, don't laugh, this is a very serious duel, thus turning off Plasma's effect and making it vulnerable. So I think these effects are a reference to that. Giving your opponent Dark Angel by using its first effect is kind of like putting it on top of their deck. This means they have to deal with the spell negation downside, which I assume is referring to stopping D-Force. And the last effect is probably a reference to the setting up of D-Force itself. But since just letting your opponent set up a free normal spell on top of their deck was kinda pointless, I guess they let you do that too. And hey, that's a perfect place to put a normal spell for Diamond Dude. It's just a shame that we live in a world with Link monsters now, so your opponent will almost always have a way to sweep Dark Angel away before it can be a real nuisance. It's more of a gimmick than anything else, and certainly shouldn't be considered a tour de force. Destiny Hero Dread Servant is a level 3 monster with 400 attack and 700 defense, and when normal summoned, you place a clock counter on each clock tower prison on the field. When destroyed by a battle and sent to the grave, you can target a spell or trap you control and destroy it. Um... Yeah, Dread Servant is right, it does a terrible job of helping you. Well, except for doing one very specific thing, but we'll have to get into the next card to see why. Clock Tower Prison is a field spell that gets a clock counter during each of your opponent's standby phases, and while it has four or more clock counters on it, you don't take any battle damage. This is a pretty great way to avoid losing the game, but it's going to draw removal pretty quickly. And that's when things get scary, because if Clock Tower Prison is destroyed and sent to the grave while it has four or more of these clock counters on it, you special summon a Destiny Hero Dreadmaster from your hand or deck. So once this hits the field, you put your opponent under a four turn clock. But what's this mysterious payoff? Well, now's as good a time as ever to pivot to some of the deck boss monsters. Destiny Hero Dreadmaster is a level 8 monster with zero attack and defense, but his stats become equal to the combined original attack of all other Destiny Heroes you control. If you special summon him with Clock Tower Prison, you can destroy all the monsters you control except Destiny Heroes, and then resurrect two Destiny Heroes from your graveyard. You don't actually have to summon him with Clock Tower Prison, you just need to do that to get this specific effect. When you summon him in general, for the rest of your turn, your Destiny Heroes are pretty much indestructible and you take no battle damage when any of them do combat at all. So if you summon him off Clock Tower, you get a nifty boost to your board presence. But otherwise, he just makes it really hard to get rid of your monsters, and act as a force doubler to make your damage output more fearsome. And with cards like Back to the Front Door, Call of the Haunted, or, you know, Cross Crusader or Dominance, you can trigger all of this on your opponent's turn without a Clock Tower Prison. It's got some strong defensive capabilities, even if it doesn't add much to advancing your gameplay. And remember, 
you can't fight destiny, but you can master it. God, that was cheesy. Why did I say that? Yeah, that wasn't even in the script. Destiny Hero Dogma is a level 8 monster with 3400 attack and 2400 defense. They can't be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by tributing 3 monsters, including at least one Destiny Hero monster. Once per turn, during your opponent's next standby phase after summoning Dogma and it's still on the field, you have your opponent's life points. Yeah, just hit your opponent with the worst part of Solemn Judgment, no big deal. You'll never beat your opponent off that effect alone, but barring any life gain shenanigans, you can guarantee your opponent it will be at or below 4,000 life points, and you've already got 3,400 of that pointed at them for battle on your next turn. It's the kind of power you'll have to see to believe. Destiny Hero Plasma is a level 8 monster with 1,900 attack and 600 defense. They also can be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by tributing 3 monsters, though this doesn't require any Destiny Heroes. While they're on the field, you negate the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent controls while they control them. It's also got a relinquished effect. You can target a monster your opponent controls and equip it to Plasma, and it gains attack equal to half the original attack of the equipped monster by that effect. It's wild how powerful this card is, versus how useful it actually is in practice. In a game where it's never been easier to spit out material, the only thing Plasma lacks as a boss monster is the ease of summon extra deck monsters provide. But if given just a little protection, a one-sided skill drain plus non-destruction removal wrapped up in a single monster is scary, even today. Playing with Plasma is a blue D good time. But as cool as Dogma and Plasma are, they get even cooler when combined. Destiny and Dragoon is a level 10 fusion monster with 3000 attack and defense that uses Destiny Heroes Dogma and Plasma as material, and their fusion summon can only use those monsters as material. Once per turn, you can target a monster your opponent controls, destroy it, and if it was face up, burn your opponent for damage equal to the attack of that monster, but you can't conduct your battle phase the turn you activate that effect. Also once per turn during your standby phase, if Destiny and Dragoon is in your grave, you can banish a Destiny hero card in your grave to special summon them. This is one of my favorite boss monsters of all times. It's got a giant stat line, removal that burns, it's a Dragoon. Sure, it's not very practical. Sure, it wasn't even very powerful back when it first came out, but I would take this Dragoon over the one that's currently agitating the metagame any day of the week. Now it's time for the support cards. Cyclone Blade is an equip spell that can only be equipped to a Destiny hero. At the end of the damage step, if the equipped monster attacked, you can target a spell or trap on the field and destroy it. Remember Amazonas Sage? Yeah, they've got that in equip spell form now. While the attack of our current Destiny heroes are pretty lackluster, we'll thankfully be getting more in the future with a more robust stat line. But even then, removing back row after committing to the battle phase just doesn't cut it. D Spirit is a normal spell that can special summon a level 4 or lower Destiny Hero monster from your hand, but you must control no face-up Destiny Hero monsters to activate and resolve the effect. This is a very strange card, as it's almost completely overshadowed by Double Summon. Sure, D Spirit isn't once per turn, but you'd need to have enough Destiny Heroes in hand to facilitate two or more, and find a way to clear those Destiny Heroes out so you can use it again. An interesting card for the novelty, but otherwise not something to watch out for. Dark City is a field spell that has an effect that triggers when your Destiny Hero monster attacks a monster with a higher attack, giving it 1000 attack for that damage calculation only. Once again, this is just the Destiny Hero version of an elemental hero card, Skyscraper. You'd think that, for a theme trying to set itself apart from elemental heroes, they'd put more effort into standing out. It even looks like the card art is in on the joke, as the two-dimensional design of the card is mirrored by the literal two-dimensional design of the buildings. Destiny Draw is a normal spell that has you discarding a Destiny Hero card to draw two cards. Once again, a single line of text that changed everything. When players stumble upon a card or effect that lets you draw at least two cards, you know duelists would kill for that kind of advantage. And it shows. You can pitch Dasher or Malicious with this card, and you can revel in not just two extra cards from your deck, but also a free special summon later on in the duel. Especially since Malicious in the Graveyard can float right away into another copy that can be used as Tribute or Synchro Fodder. Plus, loading up your graveyard with Dark Monsters can pave the way for iconic boss monsters like Dark on the Dragon. Think about it, Destiny Draw has been the blueprint of crafting new draw cards for more than a decade. The pot of cards are generic enough for almost any deck to plus, 
but they usually come with some restrictions or hefty costs that drastically change how certain decks are built. Meanwhile, cards like Destiny Draw offer more specific in-archetype draw support that also get your engine going. Allure of Darkness, Trade-In, Solar Recharge, Pantheism of the Monarchs, and Cards of Consonants have all been meta-defining in one way or another, and they can all draw their lineage from this single card. Over Destiny is a normal spell you can activate by targeting a Destiny Hero monster in your grave. On resolution, you special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your deck with a level equal to or less than half of the target's level, but you destroy the monster you summon during the end phase. So this is a pretty nifty payoff for running your bigger Destiny Heroes. Dreadmaster, Dogma, and Plasma all give you access to your level 4s, so you can get another crack at milling a good spell off the top of your deck with Diamond Dude, while Dasher and Malicious can summon out Doom Lord to get you some temporary removal. It's also a lot more helpful nowadays, as you can convert that monster into some kind of extra deck summon. So it's a Destiny Hero spell that's actually gotten better with age, and I just can't get over that. Deformation is a continuous spell that gains a D counter each time a number of face-up Destiny Hero monsters you control are destroyed, and it gains one counter for each. When you normal or special summon a monster during your main phase, you can send this card with two or more D counters to the grave to add up to two cards from your deck and or grave to your hand with the same name as that monster. This is a weird one, not gonna lie. The only part of this card that needs Destiny Heroes is the part where you gain counters, but aside from that, Deformation can be used to search anything. You could use this with Kawaki Maru to add an extra copy of some of the monsters to fulfill their maintenance cost. You could activate it on the summon of a hand trap to put the rest of them into your hand for later turns, though it will miss timing on many of the ones that actually summon themselves. Or you could normal summon Golden Ladybug, add two to your hand, and gain a thousand life points during each of your standby phases. Um, yeah, I don't really have any good ways to use this. There are so few cards that reward you for having multiples. It really gets in the way of the formation of a good combo. D-Force is a continuous spell that you can activate to add a Destiny Hero Plasma from your deck or grave to your hand. And while Plasma's on the field, three effects apply. One, you can't draw during your draw phase. Two, your opponent can't target cards you control with card effects. And three, each plasma you control gains 100 attack for each monster in both players' graves, can't be destroyed by card effects, and can also make a second attack during each battle phase. Um, wow? This really bumps up plasma as the premier boss monster for the deck. Blanket targeting protection, effect destruction immunity, and a whole slew of battle benefits. Sure, the lack of a draw phase kinda sucks, but between Destiny Draw, Celestial, and the Odd Disc Commander, you'll have all the card draw you could ever want. It certainly is a force to be reckoned with. Dr. D is a normal spell that has you banishing a Destiny Hero monster from your grave to either add to hand or special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your grave. Also, you can banish Dr. D from your grave to target two Destiny Hero monsters you control and have the attack of one become the attack of the other. So we have a monster reborn for our theme, which can get a lot of our bigger fusions, and because we're going to have a lot of fusion material in the grave, you won't be short on resources for this card's cost. Then you can just turn any of your smaller Destiny Heroes into just as much of a haymaker as that fusion, or set up Dystopia for another effect activation. Despite all that, I'm not sure if it's worth any deck space at the moment, but we won't know until we do some experimentation. D-Shield is a normal trap that triggers when an attack position Destiny Hero you control is targeted for an attack. You target said monster, change it to defense position, and equip it with D-Shield, and the equipped monster cannot be destroyed by battle. And that's a pretty exciting prospect, considering the stats many of our monsters have. Captain Tenacious will have a much easier time sticking to the field to revive more Destiny heroes, and Diamond Dude will have some more turns to perhaps excavate some good spells. I know I have a lot of negative things to say about some of these monsters, but this card really helps shield them from criticism. D-Time is a normal trap that you can activate when a face-up elemental hero you control leaves the field. When it resolves, you add a Destiny hero from your deck to your hand, whose level is less than or equal to that elemental hero's original level. This could have had some kind of usage if the more useful Destiny heroes were of lower levels, but for now it just makes for a good excuse to get together and talk about our heroic exploits over D. Destiny Signal is a normal trap that can be activated when a monster you control is destroyed by battle and sent to the grave. When it resolves, you special summon a level 4 or lower Destiny hero from your hand or deck. Now, if that all sounds like the effect of Hero Signal, then you'd be right. Aside from the Destiny hero branding, it works exactly the same. 
Dang, there really isn't any originality in the comic book industry nowadays, is there? D-Chain is a normal trap that has you targeting a Destiny Hero monster you control and equipping it to that target. The equipped monster gains 500 attack points, and when they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you burn your opponent for 500 damage. The legacy of Joey Wheeler's Kunai with Chain lives on in this equipped trap but swaps the battle position utility for burn damage. And I can't really fault it for that. I mean, Chain Burn was a pretty fearsome deck after all. Destiny Mirage is a normal trap you can activate when a Destiny Hero monster you control is destroyed by an opponent's card effect and sent to the grave. When it resolves, you special summon to your side of the field all Destiny Heroes that were destroyed by anything and sent to either grave that turn. So congrats, you now have the perfect counter to Torrential Tribute, and can even scoop up your opponent's Destiny Heroes if they're playing them as well. Which is an interesting bit of card design. At worst, it's a one-for-one -one piece of revival that's very conditional, and at best it can bring back a whole battalion. But don't be fooled by the illusion of value. A card that good can only be a mirage. D-Counter is a normal trap you can activate when a Destiny Hero monster you control is targeted for an attack, and when it resolves, the attacking monster is destroyed. So hey, you have an on-theme Sakuretsu armor, and the upside is that it bypasses targeting protection. And once again, I have to emphasize how important that is for protecting your smaller Destiny heroes. Let's face it, you aren't going to be running over your opponent's monsters, but with the help of this card, you'll knock them down for the count. Err. D Fortune is a normal trap that you can activate when your opponent declares a direct attack, allowing you to banish a Destiny Hero monster from your grave to end the battle phase. Pretty nifty way to ensure you survive a turn, but unlike Electromagnetic Turtle, this card will remain vulnerable on the field for your opponent to pick off during the main phase 1, which is rather unfortunate. Eternal Dread is a normal trap that places two clock counters on each clock tower prism. Yeah. That's all it does. If you want to really invest in the Dreadmaster game plan while accomplishing nothing else, then Eternal Dread is the card for you. Like, I get it was a different time, but imagine all the things you could be running instead of Eternal Dread. You could be using a bevy of interesting trap cards with a variety of functions, but right now there's some poor sap out there that's taking a minus one to get halfway to a condition that keeps them from taking any battle damage. Yeah, it might save your bacon in some games, and you might even be able to activate it in response to some removal from your opponent, placing the last few counters you needed to trigger its summoning effect, but more often than not, suboptimal choices like this is a quick way to get your opponent to clean your clock. Part 2. Arc V. Much like his time in GX, Astro Phoenix served as a minor antagonist in Arc V, acting as the commander in chief of the Fusion Dimension forces invading the Xyz Dimension, until being defeated and subsequently kind of befriending the main character. And since this Astro is a military man, his tactics are a lot more aggressive, and leans much more heavily into the Fusion theme. Destiny Hero Drilldark was a meta monster in Duel Links, and it's a level 4 monster with 1600 attack and 1200 defense points. And if normal or special summon, you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your hand to attack less than or equal to Drill Darks on the field. One thing that we can mention is that it can basically give you a free Xyz if you don't get Baylor. Smile. It also deals spears in battle damage! Probably the only thing that it has over Solid Soldier, because Solid Soldier can summon any level 4 or lower hero from your hand, regardless of attack points. The only innate target Destiny Hero Drill Dark has that can summon and Solid can is. Destiny Hero Malicious. Not a strong card, really, all things considered. But I do admire their dedication to Gurren Lagan. Okay, that's not entirely fair. They can also summon Destiny Hero Dynatag, a level 5 monster with a thousand attack and defense. During damage calculation, when you would take battle damage, as a quick effect, you can discard Dynatag to take no battle damage from that battle, and if you do, each player takes a thousand points of effect damage. You can also banish them from the grave to target a Destiny Hero monster you control, and it gains a thousand attack until the end of your opponent's turn. A thousand attack is nothing to sneeze at, it can help you get over a lot of stuff, but since it doesn't last very long, it's hard to recommend. But I do like the idea of holding a Dynatag in hand until your opponent makes an attack with less than a thousand life points, then you drop the Dynatag to save yourself from lethal damage and end the game with a bang. Destiny Hero Decider is a level 4 monster with 1600 attack and 1000 defense. Level 6 or higher monsters cannot target this card for attacks, and it has two effects that you can activate once per duel. If normal or special summoned, you can add a hero monster from your grave to your hand during the end phase. The trigger happens on summon but resolves in the end phase, so make sure to keep that in mind in case your opponent tries to negate once it's too late. 
Also, when a Carter effect is activated that would inflict damage to you while Decider is in the grave, you can return Decider to your hand, and if you do, make the effect damage to you zero. This is pretty useful for keeping yourself safe when using the effect of Dynatag, but can also pair with Performage Trick Clown if you're in the mood to play a little Clown Blade. There's a debate to be had if you should even consider running a card like this. Having its effects only be once per duel means it'll turn into a vanilla fairly quickly, but hey, that's for you to decide. Destiny Hero Dreamer is a level 1 monster with 0 attack and 600 defense, and during damage calculation, if your Destiny Hero monster battles and Dreamer is in your grave, you can special summon Dreamer from the grave, and if you do, your battling monster cannot be destroyed by that battle, and you take no battle damage from it. But Dreamer is banished when it leaves the field after that. This is an interesting card to use as fusion material, giving the resulting fusion monster some level of battle protection, but... We just don't live in a world anymore where that's a widely applicable effect. I mean, as a Gladiator Beast fan, I'd love to have a format or two where the battle phase was a huge factor in winning games, but that's just not gonna happen anymore, though we can always dream, right? Destiny Hero Dystopia is a level 8 fusion monster with 2800 attack and 2400 defense, requiring any two Destiny Hero monsters as material. If special summoned, you can target a level 4 or lower Destiny Hero in your grave and inflict damage to your opponent equal to its attack. And if Dystopia's current attack is ever different from their original attack, as a quick effect, you can target a card on the field, destroy it, and if you do, Dystopia's attack is reset to its original attack. This is a pretty funky piece of interaction that combos really well with the myriad of attack boosting effects we just happen to have. Elemental Hero Sunrise, Extra Hero Dread Decimator, and because we're in a post sold world, Phoenix Blade is a quick way to add just enough oomph to get the ability online. Just make sure to read up on rulings for how stat modifications work, because you'll be fielding a lot of questions if you take this to a tournament. Destiny Hero Dusktopia is a level 10 fusion monster with 3000 attack and defense, requiring a Destiny Hero fusion monster and any other Destiny Hero as material. If fusion summoned, you can fusion summon a fusion monster from your extra deck, using monsters from your hand or field as material. So it's like Albion the Stigmata Dragon, but where that monster's effect works like Miracle Fusion, Dusktopia works like regular polymerization. Also once per turn is a quick effect you can target a monster on the field, and it cannot be destroyed by battle or card effect, and neither player takes any damage from battles involving that monster until the end of the turn. So not only does it have an impressively statted body, it also doubles the effectiveness of your fusion effects. You still need to have the proper material, but you won't need to have a second effect to get the ball rolling. And the shielding quick effect is a great way to keep your monsters and your life points safe from harm. It's just so weird that, as a new boss monster for them, its effect feels so... bland. If Dystopia was the dawn of a new day for Destiny Heroes, then this one is certainly the Dusk. We've also got our new way to fusion summon for our Dark Heroes, D-Fusion, a normal trap that lets you fusion summon a fusion monster from your extra deck, using monsters you control as fusion material, and if you do, it can't be destroyed by battle or card effect that turn. However, only Destiny Heroes can be used as fusion material for this effect. Now, while this can summon more than just Destiny Heroes, the pool you have to work with is still pretty shallow. You're basically better off using them as super poly targets instead of defusion payoffs. It's also pretty restrictive that you have to use only on-field materials, I suppose to push the usage of Drill Dark, but the destruction immunity for the turn is pretty nice, especially if you need to fold your monsters into a blocker to keep you safe for the turn. But watch out if this ever gets to be popular, because you don't want to confuse it for another popular card, D-Fusion. I'd hate to deal with that misunderstanding off of a mind crush. Part 3, Legacy. Other Destiny Hero support would be released as the game progressed, with much of it coming from the core set Dark Neostorm, and I tell you what, Destiny Hero sure did cover the dark part. Destiny Hero Draw Hand is a level 4 monster with 1600 attack and 800 defense, and if special summoned by the effect of a hero monster, you can make each player draw a card. A wonderful effect to pair with Masked Hero Dark Law to rip a card out of your opponent's hand while getting one for yourself. Also during the next standby phase, after being sent to the grave, you can special summon them to the field, but they're banished if they leave the field. And thankfully, this procs their own draw effect. All that being said, unless you're going back to the days of Dark Law Protect the Castle builds, I don't think you'll find many people willing to add a card to their deck that lets your opponent draw a card, even if they have excellent taste in finger guns. Destiny Hero Denier is a level 3 monster with 1100 attack and 600 defense. If normal or special summoned, you can take one of your Destiny Hero monsters from your deck, grave, or that's banished, and place it on top of your deck. And if you have a Destiny Hero monster on your field or in your grave, except another copy of Denier, you can special summon this monster from your grave, but you can only use this effect once per duel. Talk about your legacy support, this card single-handedly lets you play like you have three malicious, no matter what the ban list says, at time of recording. 
Use Mally's effect once, then summon Denier to put the first banished Mally back into your deck. So when you link away or fuse with Mally number two, you'll be able to get back your original Mally to extend your plays even further. Heck, since it can summon itself from the grave, it works wonders with a card we'll talk about later on, Fusion Destiny. Send Mally and Denier to grave as fusion material, summon a new Mally, then summon Denier out of your grave using its own effect. This card's a game changer, no denying that. D Tactics is a continuous trap that, during your standby phase, lets you grant all your heroes a permanent 400 attack boost. If a level 8 or higher Destiny Hero or Destiny and Dragoon is special summoned to your field, you can banish a card from your opponent's field, grave, or randomly from their hand. If D Tactics is in the spell and trap zone and destroyed by a card effect, you can add any Destiny Hero monster from your deck to your hand. Not only is this card a throwback to Aster's first real duel against Jaden, it also harkens back to the time where you had to wait until standby phases to get your effects. What a classic. It is nice that it adds some removal to your summons, especially with the newer, easier to deploy Destiny heroes at your disposal, but is the removal and the float really worth the deck space? Honestly, I don't know. Even the attack boost has me thinking that this could see a lot of use in a control-oriented style of Destiny heroes, to really tack tick your opponent off. Break the Destiny is a normal trap that has you targeting a level 8 or higher Destiny hero monster or Destiny and Dragoon you control. You destroy it, and if you do, your opponent skips their next main phase 1. You can also banish this card from your grave to add a spell or trap card from your deck to your hand that specifically lists a Destiny hero monster card or Destiny and Dragoon in its text, except another copy of itself. But you can only use one of these effects per turn, and only once per turn. Though I'm not sure why you'd ever want to use both in the same turn, but I digress. This combos pretty well with Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer because it'll just get summoned right back, or Dominance because they float into three Destiny heroes. But the effect itself loses a lot of effectiveness as the game progresses. Unless you're running Thunder of Ruler to incorporate gimmicky turn skips, your opponent's still gonna get a main phase 2 to retaliate, and you won't have Destroyer to help interrupt those plays. Unless you were able to summon another giant Destiny hero to feed to break, but if you've got the resources to pull that off, you're probably better served following a different play sequence. But if you're playing a plasma-focused variant, this is actually a pretty stellar inclusion, as finding a way to put it into the grave searches you D-Force, which in turn searches your plasma. Just make sure you like the deck before committing to resolving this card, as breaking the destiny avoids the warranty. Fusion Destiny is a normal spell, and probably one of the most impactful cards for heroes to come out in recent memory. You fusion summon any fusion monster that lists a destiny hero monster as material, using monsters from your hand or deck as fusion material but it's destroyed during the end phase of the next turn. Also, you cannot special summon monsters for the rest of the turn, except dark hero monsters. So, personally, I'm loving that it makes Destiny and Dragoon at the drop of a hat, but more importantly, it's a way to send cards like Malicious directly to the grave to get more advantage out of them. And with the increase of dark heroes of other categories, this restriction gets less and less bothersome. I guess it's just the way you have to play the deck now. It's your destiny. But you don't just have to send Destiny Heroes, because Destiny Hero Dangerous, a level 6 fusion monster with 2000 attack and 2600 defense, requires a Destiny Hero and any dark effect monster. So you can send any number of things, zombies, phantom knights, mallow branches, orchists, you name it. Also, as a quick effect, you can discard a card to send a Destiny Hero from your hand or deck to the grave, and if you do, each Destiny Hero monster you control gains 200 attack until the end of the turn for each Destiny Hero in your grave. While its most immediate benefit involves dumping a bunch of good grave-based cards, I think this gives a ton of help to more casual Destiny Hero pilots. The lower attack scores of a lot of earlier Destiny Heroes held them back from their true potential, but with Dangerous, you can make these monsters much more, well, dangerous. Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer is a level 8 fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2100 defense, requiring a level 6 or higher hero monster and any Destiny Hero monster as material. Monsters your opponent controls lose 200 attack for each hero card in your grave, and as a quick effect, you can destroy both one card you control and a card on the field, an effect that conspicuously lacks any kind of targeting. Also, if destroyed by a battle or card effect, you can activate an effect where you can special summon a Destiny Hero monster from your grave during the standby phase of the next turn, which does not exclude itself. This means you can pop any card your opponent controls, bypassing any targeting protection, and if you pop your own destroyer as part of the effect, you get them right back. 
You can even use this in response to removal that banishes so you can get him off the field before being lost forever. And on top of competing with Red-Eyes Dark Dragoon of all things for Verte's top spot, it also has a reverse Sunriser effect, debuffing your opponent's monsters for every hero card in your grave. It's not much in decks that are going to just splash them in, but in a dedicated deck this can be a ferocious debuff. Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer is going to be a format staple for some time to come, but the most important thing about them is that I was right. I told you. I told all of you that Phoenix Enforcer was a Destiny hero and none of you would listen to me, but who's laughing now? <laughs> Sorry. Our last Destiny hero is Destiny Hero Dominance, a level 10 monster with 2900 attack and 2600 defense, requiring any three Destiny Hero monsters as material. During your main phase, you can look at the top five cards of either player's deck, then place them on top of the deck in any order. When they destroy a monster by battle, you draw a card, and if Dominance is destroyed by battle or card effect after having been fusion summoned, you can target three level 9 or lower Destiny Hero monsters in your grave with different names and special summon them. This is what I imagine. But the payoff for Fusion Destiny was meant to be dump three monsters, get a huge one that can either ensure your top decks are good or your opponents are suboptimal, and when it's blow up because of Fusion Destiny, you get them all right back. Draw Hand could activate so everyone gets to draw. Dreadmaster can activate the effect to protect all of your teammates. And if you have them in Grave already, get back other impactful fusions like Dangerous or Dystopia. Unfortunately, it seems that despite doing all of that and letting you draw cards, it just doesn't have what it takes to dominate the metagame. Wait, I'm using dominance. Am I out of meta? Oh my god! That may be our last Destiny Hero, but it's not the last card I want to talk to you about today, because despite being part of a different category of hero, it's intrinsically linked with the theme. Extra Hero Cross Crusader is a Link 2 monster with 1600 attack, requiring any two warrior monsters. This is an important step in the combos of modern hero builds. It essentially lets you use your malicious summon to search out any other hero you need, as well as banking two Link materials for the summon of Dread Decimator. It's a little less useful now that you don't need Link arrows to facilitate your plays, but I think the deck as a whole is thankful for the lack of restrictions regardless. You certainly don't want to cross paths with this extreme vigilante. Issue number three, Neospace. Not long after the start of Season 2 of GX, Jaden and Aster had their first real duel, with the Destiny heroes coming out on top. And because the villainous Sartorius Kumar had imbued Aster's deck with the Light of Destruction, Jaden lost his connection to dueling and almost quit for good. However, an unusual series of events causes Jaden to be transported to Neospace, a dual spirit world that's meant to maintain the precarious balance between light and dark. And wouldn't you know it, that's also where a space capsule from Kaiba Corp had landed, containing a bunch of cards Jaden designed as a little kid. Shortly before he was subject to a medical procedure to erase any memory of having done so, because Jaden also requested that Ubel be sent into space to attempt to calm their spirit with space waves, but just caused Jaden to have debilitating nightmares, probably from the immense guilt of shooting their overprotective guardian into the galactic void. Dang, GX's plot gets wild. For this issue, we'll start by talking about the Neospatians and their support, then we'll move on to cards specifically for elemental hero Neos, and lastly round things out by going through the Neos fusions. Part 1, Neospatians. All of our extraterrestrial friends are level 3, but bounce all over the place when it comes to their types and attributes. Neospatian Air Hummingbird is a wind-winged beast monster with 800 attack and 600 defense, and once per turn you can gain 500 life points for each card in your opponent's hand. Much like Elemental Recharge, there isn't much use for extra life points outside of A Hero Lives, but it is nice to have some incidental life gain to help give you another turn or two. And on top of that, they just seem really energetic. They really are the life of the party. Neospatian Aqua Dolphin is a water warrior monster with 600 attack and 800 defense. Once per turn, you can discard a card to look at your opponent's hand, then choose one monster from among them. If you have a monster with greater or equal attack as the chosen monster, you destroy the chosen monster and burn your opponent for 500 damage. Otherwise, you take 500 damage. Aqua Dolphin's a prime example of how quickly any given card can go from pack filler to format thriller. 600 attack by itself wasn't going to snipe much out of your opponent's hand back in the day, but with the advent of lower attack hand traps and easy access by way of Neospace Connector, this card quickly became a combo insulator that gives you perfect knowledge of what your opponent has up their sleeve so you know how to adapt. 
Even if you miss, 500 life points is a small price to pay for all that info, especially since you can fit them into warrior link combos. Yeah, despite being called Aqua Dolphin, they just completely disregard that type. A decision that has since made ESOL players, myself included, very, very happy. Neospatian Dark Panther is a Dark Beast monster with 1000 attack and 500 defense. Once per turn, you can target a face up monster your opponent controls, and until the end phase, you replace Dark Panther's name with that target's name, and replace this effect with all the targeted monster's effects, if any. This is probably the coolest Neospatian out of the bunch, letting you turn your opponent's board against them if they have any activated effects that could benefit you. And if you're worried about mirror matches going into a tournament, you could slot this into your side deck to gain access to helpful payoffs going second, or copy their name for anything with name dependent effects. But the funny thing is, if it does copy something else's name, you likely aren't going to be using it for contact fusion, which is kind of the archetype's whole deal. Its effects may not help the rest of the archetype too much, but I still think this is one cool cat. Neospatian Flare Scarab is a fire insect monster with 500 attack and defense, and they gain 400 attack for each spell and trap your opponent controls. This means that the maximum attack they can reach is 2900, which is pretty impressive for a level 3 normal summon. But if you think you're going to get in a single attack against 5 back row and a field spell, then you'll want to prepare yourself emotionally, because you're about to get burned. Neospatian Glowmoss is a light plant monster with 300 attack and 900 defense, and if they attack or are attacked, your opponent draws a card, reveals it, then based on the type of card, apply one of three effects. If it's a monster, the battle phase just ends. If it's a spell, the attack becomes a direct attack, but only if Glowmoss is attacking. And if it's a trap, Glowmoss is changed to defense position. This has gotta be my least favorite member of the team. I want to try and find something positive to say about whatever I cover so I'm not just defaulting to the negative, but for the life of me I don't know what strategy this is supposed to help. Giving your opponent cards might be helpful if it comes with a powerful enough upside, generators have taught us that, but the possibility of ending the battle phase or attacking directly just isn't on the same level. Moss doesn't grow on a rolling stone, so I'd advise you keep going downhill because you do not want any of this. Going from the least powerful to the most format warping, Neospatian Grand Mole is an earth rock monster with 900 attack and 300 defense, and at the start of the damage step, if it battles an opponent's monster, you can return both the opponent's monster and Grand Mole to their owner's hand. This effect is so strong, it's seen a lot of time on the Forbidden and Limited list, and it's not hard to see why. In a simplified game state, when it all comes down to the normal summon, Grandmole can be an oppressive threat that bounces back anything you throw out on the field. But since situations like that have become more and more rare, Mole has been released from the limited cage to roam free with the rest of their Neospatian buddies. People used to say he was on burrowed time, but now he's just doing a mole out of nothing. Two of them also have alternate fusion forms with no material, kind of like masked heroes, that are unlocked by Nex. It's a normal spell that has you sending a face-up Neospatian monster you control to the grave to special summon a level 4 monster with the same name from your extra deck. Yeah, same name, which I'm sure has never caused any issue with official deck building, ever. But yeah, like the card says, both of these are level 4, can't be summoned except by Nex, and share the same type and attribute as their base form. Neospatian Marine Dolphin counts as Aqua Dolphin, but with 900 attack and 1100 defense, and has the same effect as them, except you don't risk taking damage if your opponent doesn't have a monster weak enough for you to destroy. Likewise, Neospatian Twinkle Moss counts as Glow Moss, but with 500 attack and 1100 defense, and shares the same effect as them, except you're the one that gets to draw the card to determine the effect. So we've got slightly improved Neospatians, but not so much that they're worth the effort of summoning out the base form, having next to evolve them, and getting a deck building in fraction from a judge because if you have three copies of Glow Moss and one Twinkle Moss in the extra, you technically have four copies of Glow Moss. I always wonder what it might have been like if we got more next forms for the rest of the Neospatians, but considering the bureaucratic nightmare that would ensue, I think I'm okay with leaving it as is. All the Neospatians also have little baby forms, the Chrysalis Monsters. They're all level 2, have 200 attack and defense less than their base form, but otherwise share the same stats. Except Chrysalis Dolphin, for some reason? Which correctly identifies that they're a fish and not a warrior. They also all share the same effect, letting you tribute them while Neospace is on the field to summon their associated base form from the Hander deck. Chicky goes with Air Hummingbird, Dolphin goes with Aqua Dolphin, Larva goes with Flare Scarab, Mole goes with Grand Mole, Pantail goes with Dark Panther, and Penny goes with Glow Moss. Now, these cards did debut in GX, but we may have seen earlier concepts of them in pre-Duel Monsters Yu-Gi-Oh! Specifically, 
capsule monsters. Mowgli and Beaton here kind of look like mole and larva, and this Hercules beetle looking unit has kind of a flare scarab vibe to him. It's a pretty interesting little tidbit, and it really encapsulates what I like when it comes to research. But what is this Neo Space card you need to make this effect live? Well, it's a field spell that grants elemental hero Neos and any fusion monster that lists it as a material a 500 attack boost. And qualifying fusions also do not have to activate their effect that returns them to the extra deck, which is otherwise mandatory. It's a beautiful maelstrom of lights and colors that helps your fusions stick around longer and hit harder. So for a pure Neos deck, it's invaluable. But as someone who has read a bit too much Lovecraft, this Neospace is a bit too color out of space for me. And Neospace can be searched with Neospace Pathfinder, a level 4 light warrior monster with 1800 attack and 800 defense. And you can discard them to the grave to add a Neospace from your deck or grave to your hand. Pathfinder is part of the long lineage of field spell searching monsters like Zeratius, Harpy Queen, and Warrior of Atlantis. But the upside to Pathfinder is that it can grab it back from the grave as well as out of the deck, so it can effectively help you run more than three copies of Neospace. They're exceedingly helpful in setting you on the right path. Pivoting back to the Chrysalis monsters for a bit, they have their own specific support cards. Cocoon Party is a normal spell that special summons a Chrysalis monster from your deck for each Neospatian monster with a different name in your grave. For the time, this was just another way to refill your field with Neospatians, and while it hasn't gotten much better, anything that can spit out a bunch of monsters onto the board for Link Summoning with minimal restrictions is definitely worth taking a look at. However, committing to this does mean you'll have to use up a lot of room in your deck, and considering the number of engines out there that can do more with less, Cocoon Party is certainly nothing to celebrate. Cocoon Rebirth is a continuous spell that lets you tribute a face-up chrysalis monster you control to special summon a Neospatian written in its card text, which translates to their associated Neospatian, from either player's graveyard. I'm not sure why it specifies either player's graveyard, but I'm sure many a kitchen table game was decided by the counterplay Cocoon Rebirth provided. It is cool that it can recycle any Neospatian, and it makes it so your Chrysalis monsters aren't entirely dependent on Neospace to function, but this card won't be reviving interest in this mini-theme anytime soon. Contact is a normal spell that sends all Chrysalis monsters you control to the grave, and you special summon a monster from your hand or deck that is written in the card text of those cards. This is another one that could really use an updated errata. Like, its wording is very specific. It says you summon one monster that is written in the card text of those cards. So does it mean one for each? Or if I send three, do I only get one, but I can pick from the three of them? And I've spent way too much time thinking about what amounts to a spell that cheats out the Neospace effect of a bunch of weird alien egg babies that no one plays. I tell you, despite the name, no one's made contact with this card in many, many years. Cocoon Veil is a normal trap that activates by tributing a face-up Chrysalis monster. For the rest of the turn, any damage to any player caused by any effect becomes zero, then special summon a Neospatian written on the tributed Chrysalis monster from your hand, deck, or either player's grave to your side of the field. This is probably the best utility card Chrysalis has available. You're still restricted to only summoning the associated Neospatian, but it can grab them from anywhere, and provides a little extra help if you fear your opponent is playing something like Trick Stars. Unfortunately, it's not good for much else, but maybe next time we get GX support, this theme will emerge from its cocoon into something much greater. Getting back to our Neospatian cards, Cross Porter is a level 2 Dark Warrior monster with 400 attack and defense, and you can have them send a monster you control to the grave to special summon a Neospatian from your hand. And when sent to the grave, you can add a Neospatian monster from your deck to your hand. This would have been an interesting card, being a self-contained way to essentially search a Neospatian by attributing itself to summon another one from the hand, if Cross Porter didn't miss timing. An interaction, or rather lack of interaction, that leaves me feeling rather cross. Space Gift is a normal spell that lets you draw a card for each Neospatian you control with a different name. That's already an upstart goblin with a single monster, and gets better the more you swarm, which pairs very well with a Loaded Grave and Cocoon Party. You know, as long as you have a way to convert those Chrysalis back into Neospatians. Once again, this is a very powerful card that's hampered by having to be run in a subpar engine, but considering how big that engine is when playing pure Neos, this card certainly is a gift. 
Common Soul is a continuous spell, and it has you selecting a face-up monster on the field when activated. You special summon a Neospatian monster from your hand to the side of the field of the monster you targeted, and that monster gains attack equal to the attack of the Neospatian you summoned from this effect. When Common Soul is removed from the field, you return the special summon monster to the hand. While not exclusively made to help you with contact fusing, it certainly gets the job done. Target a Neos, summon a Neospatian out of your hand, and you've got all the ingredients you need right there. But it can also help you to attack over monsters you couldn't otherwise. Remember, Dark Panther has a thousand attack. An Axe of Despair can turn a monster from a nuisance to a huge threat out of nowhere. And personal note, I'm so glad that they actually printed Common Soul at Common, otherwise I'd be throwing a huge fit right now. Contact Gate is a normal spell that has you banishing two different Neospatians from your grave as cost. When it resolves, you special summon two Neospatians with different names from your hand, deck, and or grave. And for the rest of the turn, you cannot special summon monsters from your extra deck, except fusion monsters. Also, if a face-up fusion monster that lists Elemental Hero Neos as material returns from the field to the extra deck, you can banish Contact Gate from your grave to special summon one of your banished Neospatians. This is one of the newer pieces of support, and it solves a lot of problems when it comes to setting up your contact fusions, especially the ones that require two or more Neospatians, and even gives you something back if you have to return the fusion to the extra deck. It's an excellent piece of card design that helps the strategy without causing it to go off the rails, and opens up the gate to a number of new play sequences. Convert Contact is a normal spell that you can only activate if you control no monsters. When activated, you send two Neospatians to the grave, one from your hand and one from your deck, then draw two cards. While the restriction does bite, I suppose it's rather thematic if we consider your field might be empty because the Neos uncontacted their fusion. What doesn't bite is that it's essentially a destiny draw that sets up your grave for Cocoon Party, and more importantly, the previously mentioned Contact Gate, as it immediately loads your grave with two Neospatians that you can banish, helping you to take your cards and convert them into a winning strategy. Part 2, Neos. Elemental Hero Neos is a level 7 light warrior normal monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense. And they're a new elemental hero that has arrived from Neospace. When he initiates a contact fusion with a Neospatian, his unknown powers are unleashed. Serving as Jaden's ace monster from Season 2 onward, Neos would harness the power of contact fusion to conquer a variety of situations, and so can you. From card draw to back row removal to effect negation, this space age space ace can do it all with a little help from their friends. If you're looking to get all the Neos benefits without the Neos level, you have the option of running Elemental Hero Neos Alias, a level 4 light warrior Gemini monster with 1900 attack and 1300 defense. They follow all the usual Gemini rules, counting as a normal monster when on the field or in the grave, and only becomes an effect monster once they've been normal summoned while on the field. And this monster's particular effect is that their name becomes Elemental Hero Neos. However, you won't be needing that very often, as its true power is being just the right convergence of parameters to make it the centerpiece of Hero Beat. Yes, I am still talking about that. As a normal hero in the grave with a high attack, it's an outstanding target for Hero Blast. As a level 4 Gemini, you can use it for Gemini Spark. As an elemental hero, it's searchable by E Emergency Call, and as a light monster, it can fill either part of the Shining's fusion material requirement. Like, nowadays, it's pretty harmless. I'd never accuse Alias of deciding, any modern games, especially with access to original Neos being better than it's ever been. But it'll always live rent-free in my head as the cornerstone of the one deck I could never, well, beat. Neospace Connector is a level 4 light warrior monster with 800 attack and 1800 defense. When normal summoned, you can special summon a Neospatian or elemental hero Neos from your hand or deck in defense position, and you can also tribute them to target a Neospatian or elemental hero Neos in your grave and special summon them to the field in defense position. This card is a prime example why designers need to be very careful when putting together new cards. On the surface, Connector is a very helpful but innocuous tool in putting together a Neos fusion. Normal summon them to get the first half, tribute them to to get the second, then go to town. But due to a total lack of restrictions, Connector became a one-card combo for resold plays that could, with the right sequencing, rip two cards out of your opponent's hand while giving you perfect knowledge of it with little to no issue. But it just goes to show that when players really want to find powerful, innovative combos, they're really good at making connections. Elemental Hero Honest Neos is a level 7 light warrior monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense. And as a quick effect, you can discard it to grant a hero monster on the field and is sounding 2500 attack until the end of the turn. And while they're on the field, also as a quick effect, 
Honest Neos can discard a hero monster, and then Honest Neos gains attack equal to the discarded hero's attack until the end of the turn. As if there was already enough attack boosting effects between all these bespandecked dinks, Honest Neos is here to help your monsters soar to even greater heights. What gets me is that it's so unusually self-referential for a card tied so closely to an ace monster. Sure, cards like Summon Gate rip on the ban list and we'll get remixes of classic cards like One by One, but Honest Neos is effectively an archetype-specific Honest that can turn other members of that archetype into Honest as well, with the only connection it has to the show being the one time that Jaden used Honest on Neos. Don't get me wrong, it's a great way to push for game to close things out, but <clears throat> this section is dragging out a bit too much. How many more times are you going to make me say the word Honest before we're done here? Uh, yeah, we're almost done. Uh, we just gotta re-record that last line. Uh, it's supposed to be, However, despite all that, I honestly wouldn't play the deck without it. Oh, nobody. You don't know who you're talking to. Do you know who I am? I made hottest number monsters! I'll be in my trailer! Call me when we get to Neo's Fusion! Huh. Neos Force is an equip spell that can only be equipped to elemental hero Neos. It gains 800 attack, and when they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you inflict damage to your opponent equal to the original attack of the destroyed monster in the grave. Also, during the end phase, Neos Force gets shuffled into the deck. So it essentially turns your Neos into Flame Wingman, and a really big one at that, but for some reason pulls the same shenanigans as your fusions do. Like, if I'm keeping Neos on the board long enough to get through a battle phase with them, at least let us keep the equip spell. I mean, it is only an equip spell, so I'm not going to force the issue, but it's still kind of annoying. But that's not the only equip spell they're featured on. Assault Armor is an equip spell you can only equip to a warrior type monster that is the only monster you control. It gains 300 attack, and during your main phase 1 you can send this equipped card to the grave to allow the equipped monster to attack twice during each battle phase this turn. The equipment restriction is basically pointless, as you're always going to want to replace the 300 attack with a double attack. The card may not be for Neo specifically, but it is thematically appropriate, as it grants them the greatest of plot armor. And much like their elemental hero, Hero contemporaries, Neos has their own signature attack spell. Wrath of Neos is a normal spell that has you selecting a face-up elemental hero Neos you control. You return it to the deck and destroy all cards on the field. Notably, this is the attack name of our favorite alien aggressor in the anime, and if it attacked like this more often, I'm sure it would see a lot more play. Racking open an entire field is a lot easier now that you can summon them out with something like Neo Space Connector, making it so you can board wipe the floor with whatever is left. And for the sake of comprehensiveness, Neo shows up on another card. Just to Break is a normal trap that you can activate when your opponent declares an attack against a face-up normal monster you control. When it resolves, all monsters on the field are destroyed, except for face-up attack position normal monsters. While battle traps like this aren't very popular at time of recording, not to mention the lack of normal monster decks, it's still hard to deny how devastating this card can be. It's even more thorough than Mirror Force cards, as Just to Break deals with defense position monsters as well. And hey, if you expect to get nibiru a lot over the course of a tournament, it's a great way to make your opponent regret that choice. Because if they proceed to attack into that token, then you just got yourself a lucky break. Part 3. Fusion. The Neos Contact Fusions manifest in a variety of combinations, but to make sure we're all on the same page, what is Contact Fusion? Well, while it's fairly codified in the anime, and is even name-dropped in Neos' flavor text, it's actually not an official game term. Rather, it's a player action that doesn't start a chain, and you complete it by following the text on the card, kind of like a Synchro or Xyz Summon with more specific instructions. And in most cases, it excludes you from using Polymerization, which is shorthand for not letting you use any fusion effect for them. Normally, I'd describe this process with less words and call it an inherent summon, but I hear this rub some more rules literate people the wrong way. And while there are slight variations on the formula, Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon and the Ritual Beast fusions come to mind, the classic version involves shuffling the fusion material monsters from your field into your deck. Let's start by going over the contact fusions that just require Neos and one Neos Spatian. They're all level 7 warrior monsters with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, and unless otherwise stated for all the contact fusions, they're shuffled into the deck during the end phase. Elemental hero Air Neos is a wind monster, requiring Neos and Air Hummingbird. While your life points are lower than your opponent's, Air Neos gains attack equal to the difference. It's Strange that Air Neos incentivizes you to have as few life points as possible, while Air Hummingbird gives you more of them, but I can't say I don't like the juxtaposition. Probably the most deadly of the Neos fusions, Air Neos can weaponize anything you do that self-inflicts damage or has you paying a lot of life points. If your opponent has a thousand of them and you're down to a thousand, then congratulations! Your 9500 attack point Air Neos just became a vessel for delivering OTKs, manifesting a win right out of thin air. Elemental hero Aqua Neos is a water monster 
monster, requiring Neos and Aqua Dolphin. Once per turn, you can discard a card to randomly destroy a card in your opponent's hand. Now, generally, the effects of the Neos fusions are meant to be an extension of the Neos Spatian they use as material. Not necessarily a direct upgrade, but more of a natural progression. And while this may be the 10 plus years of card design hindsight talking, but Aqua Neos might actually be worse than Aqua Dolphin. Like back then, it would have been really hard to resolve Aqua Dolphin's effect, while Aqua Neos' effect is guaranteed. But you're not getting to see your opponent's hand, and for the effort of getting out and hopefully maintaining the fusion, it doesn't push the effect in a meaningful way, leading to a watered down version. And to make things just a little more confusing, Elemental Hero Marine Neos is a level 8 water monster with 2800 attack and 2300 defense, requiring Neos and Marine Dolphin, the next boosted version of Aqua Dolphin. Once per turn, you can destroy a random card from your opponent's hand without needing to discard, and whatever's in that next juice is certainly putting in some great work, because Marine Neos lacks the effect that forces them back into the extra deck during the end phase. Now this is some card design I can get behind. If we do get more next Neos Spatians, I hope we get a whole new slew of upgraded Neos fusions to go along with them. Sure, you're still just destroying a random card, but at least now you don't have to rely on a field spell to keep them on the field, the effect is free, and they get to be just a bit beefier. I do hope this gets to be the basis of some new card design, because it's certainly making waves. Elemental Hero Dark Neos is a dark monster requiring Neos and Dark Panther. If they're not already targeting a card with the following effect, Dark Neos can target a face-up effect monster on the field, and while this monster is face-up on the field, the effects of the targeted monster are negated. So it's like a fiendish chain on a body that can actually refresh its target whenever it no longer has one. It's an odd effect considering the Neos Fusion's effervescent nature, but we take what we can get. At least it is some kind of effect negation for the theme, so it's not totally Lawful. Elemental Hero Flare Neos is a fire monster requiring Neos and Flare Scarab, and they gain 400 attack for every spell and trap on the field, not just your opponents. So yeah, that thing that was said about how the Neos effects aren't just strictly better versions of the original Neos patients, yeah, Flare Neos doesn't seem to care about the need to easily categorize the tropes of themes so they can be conveyed easily. Flare Neos is just a strictly better Flare Scarab with a higher base attack that no longer relies entirely on your opponent to make the most of them. It may be a troublemaker, but I'll give them this. They got flair. Elementar Hero Glow Neos is a light monster that requires Neos and Glow Moss. Once during your main phase 1, target the face of card your opponent controls and destroy it for free. Psych! If you have to apply one of the following effects depending on what card you destroyed because this is 2003 and you have no free effects. If it was a monster, Lonios can attack the turn. If it was a spell, Lonios can attack directly. And if it was a trap card, you change Lonios to defense position. It is amazing to have such free removal that punishes you for using it if you go after monsters or traps. But if you go after a spell, you have permission to end the game basically. It's a marked improvement, not gonna lie, over the less than nothing effect of their base form. So unlike the moss, I'm giving this Neos a glowing review. Elemental Hero Grand Neos is an earth monster requiring Neos and Grand Mole. You can have them target a monster your opponent controls and return that target to the hand. Yeah, it's just that simple. Compulsory evacuation device on demand. This is probably the most practical of the Neos fusions, as bouncing effects are incredible for getting around most protections and triggers, and might as well just be hard removal against extra deck monsters. When it comes to breaking boards, Grand Neos plays more than just a drill bit part. Next we have the fusions that require Neos plus two Neo Spatians. While they still have to return themselves to the extra deck during the end phase, all of them trigger a pretty big effect whenever they do so by that effect. They're also all level 9, and have 3000 attack and 2500 defense. Elemental Hero Chaos Neos is a dark monster, requiring Neos, Dark Panther, and Glow Moss. When shuffled into the deck by its own effect, you set all face-up monsters on the field face down. Also, during your main phase 1, you can toss a coin three times and apply one of three effects to depending on the number of heads. For 3, you destroy all monsters your opponent controls. For 2, the effects of all face-up monsters your opponent controls are negated for the rest of the turn. And for 1, you return all monsters you control to the hand. So ignoring the absolutely incredible art here, I... I feel like this card is insulting me. 
Like, getting all the material onto the board for its summon is a huge task all on its own, but if I use its effect, there's a chance I'll just bounce my entire monster lineup to my hand? I can't imagine what a Zero Heads result would have been if they'd thought of one, because if they did, I'm sure I'd be flipping out. Ah, uh, Magma Neos. The ultimate fusion of Neos, Flare, Scarab, and Grandma. This fire boy never, and I mean never, skipped gym day. Just look at those muscles. Look at them! If that doesn't state how strong he is, just let's look at his effect. Since Magma Neos gains 400 attack for every card on the field, yes, every single one. That means that by the virtue of existing, his attack goes to 3400 and can only get higher. I love it when big number go brrrr. And Magma Neos provides just that. His closing act is also extremely powerful. Returning all the cards that gave him those attack points to the hand is not to be taken lightly. As far as I know, there's no protection against such an effect. And with that, after punching your opponent with the attack, you can go scorched to earth on all the cards. Elemental hero Storm Neos is a wind monster requiring Neos, Air Hummingbird, and Aqua Dolphin. Once per turn, they can activate a heavy storm effect, destroying all spells and traps on the field, and, when shuffled into the extra deck by its own effect, all cards on the field are shuffled into their owner's deck. That's even more brutal than Magma Neos. While Storm may not have the multi monstrosity's raw attack power, you'll be able to clear out back row so it doesn't get in the way of an offensive push, and if your opponent is still left standing, you just put everything back in the deck and dare them to rebuild their board next turn. With the ability to blow away any threats and rain on my opponent's parade, no wonder this is my favorite Neos fusion. Elemental hero Nebula Neos is an earth monster requiring Neos, Grand Mole, and Dark Panther. If special summon from the extra deck, you can draw cards equal to the number of cards your opponent controls, then negate the effects of a face of card in the field until the end of the turn. Also, when shuffled into the extra deck by its own effect, all cards on the field are banished face down. This is one of the more modern Neos cards, and it definitely shows. With its first effect, you can restock your hand against an established board, and even target itself for negation so that it can't be forced to return to the extra deck for a turn. Alternatively, you can negate the effects of a card that'll get in the way of your plays, let Nebula Neos go back to the extra during the end phase, and then evenly match your opponent's entire field. I hope we get more Neos fusions like this, because much like its namesake, Nebula Neos is a stellar card. The last Neos Contact Fusion is a real doozy and plays by its own rules. Elemental hero Cosmo Neos is a level 11 light monster with 3500 attack and 3000 defense, requiring Neos and three Neos Spaceians with different attributes. If special summoned from the extra deck, you can activate an effect that for the rest of the turn keeps your opponent from activating cards or effects, and your opponent cannot activate cards or effects in response to that effect's activation. And when it's shuffled into the extra deck by its own effect, all cards your opponent controls are destroyed. And because you've shut off your opponent's ability to activate effects, those cards aren't going to trigger any of their floating effects if they have any. So no Dante activation for you. It's also the first Neo Fusion that doesn't apply the board wipe to both sides. And honestly, it's about time, especially since you have to put four materials into this one. But if you can manage to prepare them with any other play sequence, you can guarantee that it will go through no matter how wacky or fragile it is. Cosmo Neos is truly a card that is out of this world. Now, while Neos is known for their contact fusions, they're actually part of quite a few traditional fusions, and much like the hero fusions we covered in issue number one, they must all be fusion summoned and cannot be summoned by other ways. Elemental hero Neos Knight is a level 7 light warrior fusion monster with 2500 attack and 1000 defense, requiring Neos in any warrior monster. They gain attack equal to half of the original attack of the warrior fusion material used for its summon except for any elemental hero Neos is used. They can make a second attack during each battle phase, but your opponent takes no damage from battles involving them. This mighty noble Neos Knight was used in the Bonds Beyond Time movie to help dispatch some of Paradox's malefic monsters, and it's still pretty good at doing that in paper too. Elemental heroes are rife with warrior monsters already, so you won't have a hard time finding fusion material for this devilishly haired bad boy, and even a 500 attack boost means Neos Knight can double attack over just about anything. It may not do any battle damage, but if you're already knocking your opponent down, you don't want to rub it in their faces with battle damage. It's just basic chivalry. Rainbow Neos is a level 10 light warrior fusion monster boasting 4500 attack and 3000 defense, requiring Neos and an ultimate crystal monster, which includes Rainbow Dragon, Rainbow Dark Dragon, or even the almighty Rainbow Over Dragon. Once per turn, you can activate one of three effects. You can either send a monster you control to the grave to shuffle all monsters your opponent controls into the deck, send a spell or trap card you control to the grave to shuffle all spell and trap cards your opponent 
controls into the deck, or send a card from the top of your deck to the grave to shuffle your opponent's entire graveyard into their deck. Phantom Knight players shudder at the thought. Rainbow Neos is a toolbox problem solver with a stat line that would make Oblis the Tormentor think twice about skipping leg day. In the past, it was held back by its anime-inspired fusion material that didn't synergize on paper. But with the advent of Neos Fusion, this card has become much easier to field. It even has some unexpected synergy with everyone's favorite conduit for fusion summoning, Verte Anaconda, letting you send the little Link monster to the grave for Rainbow Neos' effect so you don't leave yourself open to a game losing attack. Armed with impressive stats and excellent removal, this Neos Fusion is a great way to rain on your opponent's parade. Elemental Hero Divine Neos is a level 12 divine- uh, hang on, let me check. Light Warrior Fusion Monster with 2500 attack and defense required 5 Neos, Neos Base, Neos Patient, and or Hero Monsters as material. But you must have at least one each of a Neos or Neos Base Monster a Neospatient, and a Hero. Once returned, you can vanish a Neos, Neospace, Neospatient, or a Hero monster from your grave to grant Divine Neos 500 attack, and until the end phase, gain the Vanish monster's effect. <laughs> that was a mouthful. Divine Neos may have missed the opportunity to add to the Divine Monster roster, and it may have some very impractical fusion material, but with this card lacks an effective design, it more than makes up for it in the cool department. As they absorb effects, their attack stat will continue to grow, and as the Hero lineup continues to grow, the more cards become available for this monster to access. It's just a shame you can't do it multiple times in the same turn to get some really wild combinations. Like imagine if you could give them Blade Edge's Piercing, Air Neos' Attack Boost, and Wild Edge's Multi-Attack? That would just be divine. Elemental Hero Brave Neos is a level 7 light warrior fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, requiring Neos and any level 4 or lower effect monster. They gain 100 attack for each Neospatian and hero monster in your grave, and that's going to help for their second effect, because when Brave Neos destroys a monster by battle, you can add one spell or trap from your deck to your hand that specifically lists Elemental Hero Neos in its card text. A true Duel Links menace, this card combined with Neos Fusion gave you a reasonably strong monster with protection that also set up powerful grave effects. And with Brave Search Effect, as long as you could punch through monsters, you could do this turn after turn. However, it's the kind of card that works well specifically in the Duel Links format. Outside of that, games aren't as decided by singularly powerful monsters that resist removal. So you'd have to be pretty brave to try using a card like this in Paper Yu-Gi-Oh! Elemental Hero Neos Kluger is a level 9 light spellcaster fusion monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, requiring Neos and Ubel as material. Before damage calculation, if Kluger battles an opponent's monster, you can inflict damage to your opponent equal to the attack of the opponent's monster. If they're face up on the field and destroyed by battle, or leave the field because of an opponent's card effect, you can special summon a Neos Wise Man from your hand or deck, ignoring summoning conditions. And what the heck is a Neos Wise Man? Well, they're a level 10 light spellcaster monster with 3000 attack and defense that cannot be normal summoned or set. And if you're not using Kluger's effect, the only other way they can be special summoned is by sending a face up elemental hero Neos and you bell you control to the grave. Wise Man cannot be destroyed by card effects, and at the end of the damage step, if they battled an opponent's monster, you burn your opponent for damage equal to that monster, and gain life points equal to that monster's defense. These two monsters represent the connection between Jaden and Ubel, but despite having really cool card design, Wise Man's been hampered by some very hostile card design. It turns out that Neos and Ubel strategies don't mix very well, but with the introduction of Neos Fusion and Kluger, you now have a much easier way to gain access to them while maintaining all the flavor. And since Kluger's burn effect triggers before damage calculation, you can have Kluger attack into something bigger than it, burn for 3000 or more damage, get Wise Man, then potentially attack over a different monster to trigger their burn effect, and grab some healing for your troubles. My only question is, where does the spellcaster typing come from? Are they trying to tell us that warrior plus fiend equals spellcaster? Cause if so, this has some very interesting implications. Now, we've mentioned Ubel quite a bit in this issue, but haven't really gone into a lot of detail about them. And barring some kind of huge update in a structure deck or a core set, there really aren't enough cards to warrant their own video. So we'll cover them here as well, considering how closely tied they've been to Neo's cards so far, and how intrinsic they are in the anime. Yubel originally hailed from an ancient kingdom, and was the best friend of a boy who would later reincarnate as Jaden, a boy that would later be known as Hao, the Supreme King. 
The boy's father, the king of this kingdom at the time, tasked Jubel with being a guardian for his son until he was old and wise enough to use the power within him, the gentle darkness, to combat the encroaching light of destruction. And upon accepting this task, Yubel assumed the form we all know and love today. In the game proper, Yubel is a level 10 Dark Fiend monster with zero attack and defense. They cannot be destroyed by battle, and you take no battle damage in battles involving them, and these effects are shared by all further versions of Yubel. Before damage calculation, when an attack position Yubel is attacked by an opponent's monster, you inflict damage to your opponent equal to that monster's attack. During your end phase, you must tribute another monster, or Yubel destroys itself. However, if they are destroyed except by their own effect, its owner can special summon a Yubel Terror Incarnate from their hand, deck, or grave. Despite their high level, Yubel is deceptively easy to put onto the board. They lack any kind of special summon restriction, so something as simple as a Mystic Tomato can get them onto the field. And since it doesn't care what destroys them, any number of cards from Dark Hole to Metal Foes can trigger that effect. Heck, it doesn't even have to be destroyed on the field, so if you were so inclined, you could just pull some silly Fire King shenanigans. Though I don't think Yubel would appreciate that too much. They're already working with another kind of king, mixing Fire Kings into all this would just be kind of awkward. Yubel Terror Incarnate is a level 11 Dark Fiend monster with zero attack and defense. They cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by the effective Yubel. Like their previous form, if your opponent targets Terror Incarnate for an attack, your opponent takes damage equal to their monster's attack. However, instead of needing another monster to stay on the field every turn, Terror Incarnate just destroys every other monster on the field during the end phase. And when they do leave the field, you can special summon a Yubel the Ultimate Nightmare from your hand, deck, or grave. So Yubel's dual monster form is referred to as a dragon, and now we're starting to see why. What's great about this is that your opponent can no longer stall you out and avoid attacking Yubel in the hopes you'll run out of monsters to defeat it. Now Terror Incarnate will eat up all of your opponent's monsters as well, but if they do answer it, then they're in for an even nastier surprise, one that I certainly wouldn't want to deal with. Yubel, the Ultimate Nightmare, is a level 12 Dark Fiend monster with zero attack and defense that cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by the effect of Yubel, Terror Incarnate. This version unlocks Yubel's full offensive might, as you no longer have to force your opponent to attack into them with cards like All Out Attack. Rather, when Ultimate Nightmare battles an opponent's monster, whether by being attacked or attacking, you burn your opponent for your opponent's monster's attack at the end of the damage step and destroy that monster. This eldritch being from beyond the stars is the culmination of Yubel's power, turning your own monsters against you before eradicating them. And if that monster resists effect destruction, then that's even worse, because now you can just attack into it over and over again until you end the duel. And while Ultimate Nightmare lacks any protection outside of battle destruction immunity, the fact that the Yubel evolutions can be summoned from the grave means that reviving even a single base form Yubel gets the entire cycle started all over again, making this Ultimate Nightmare an unending one as well. Okay, brief tangent aside, let's focus on the support cards for the Neos Fusions. Contact Out is a quick play spell that returns a Neos Fusion monster you control to the extra deck, and if all of the fusion materials that are listed on it are in your deck, you can special summon them. This makes it so you can at least keep something if your Neos Fusions are destined to leave the field, though this does mean you won't be getting the benefit from your three material fusions. However, this does have some very specific synergy with Nebula Neos, as its effects are not once per turn. Contact Fuse for Nebula to draw some cards and get a negate, Contact Out to get the material back, maybe do something fun with Dark Panther while they're back on the field, then contact for Nebula again to draw even more cards and negate another card. But even outside of a very specific value play like this, it's a great way to avoid contact with your opponent's interaction. Double Hero Attack is a quick play spell that you can activate if you control a fusion monster that lists Elemental Hero Neos as a material. You target a hero fusion monster in your grave, and when it resolves, you special summon it, ignoring summoning conditions. This card is going to absolutely end some games out of nowhere if you're going deep on the hero fusions, especially if you grab what the art suggests. By that point in the duel, Shining Flare Wingman is going to have a ton of attack points but in a lot of cases, it's just too impractical. Like, look at the artwork again. What's gonna happen to that Shining Flare Wingman if you don't win the game that turn and Magma gets shuffled away? Yeah, not good things. So when adding this to your deck, make sure to double check your win conditions. 
Instant Neo Space is an equip spell you can equip to any fusion monster that lists Elemental Hero Neos as material, and it doesn't have to activate the mandatory effect that shuffles them into the deck during the end phase while equipped. And if the equipped monster does leave the field, you can special summon an Elemental Hero Neos from your hand, deck, or grave. This helps to alleviate the need for Neo Space, and while you aren't going to get the 500 attack boost like from the field spell, getting a Neos back to replace your fusion is more than a fair trade. However, it doesn't really advance your game plan, and is just as susceptible to spell and trap removal as the real thing, so I'm not too keen on running it this instant. Neos Fusion allows you to special summon a fusion monster from your extra deck that lists exactly two material, including elemental hero Neos, ignoring its summoning condition, by sending those fusion materials from your hand, deck, or field to the graveyard. For the rest of the turn after you resolve Neos Fusion, you can't special summon monsters at all. And if any number of those fusion monsters you control that list Elemental Hero Neos' as material will be destroyed by battle or card effect, or shuffled into the extra deck by their own effect, you can banish Neos Fusion from the grave instead. This card is a huge boost to the deck, skipping all that pesty gathering the right monsters and getting them onto the field steps and getting right to the good part, summoning a 2500 attack monster that can take a single card out of the opponent's hand and nothing else. I guess you could also summon like... Brave Neos or Rainbow Neos, but come on, you and I both know that you're gonna exploit a fusion spell meant to summon a monster that represents the bond between a protagonist and the bestest best friend, you're just gonna use Red Eyes Fusion. By the way, you wanna know what an awful wasteland Duel Links is? This card is our foolish burial. Miracle Contact is a normal spell that has you shuffling the fusion materials for an Elemental Hero fusion monster that lists Elemental Hero Neos as material from your hand, field, or grave into your deck to special summon that fusion monster from your extra deck, ignoring summoning conditions. Now this is what should be the basis for all Neos decks moving forward. While Neos Fusion does a great job of giving you access to your two material fusions, they can't help with the bigger ones, and thankfully both Neos Fusion and Convert Contact set up your grave for a big Miracle Contact. Cosmo Neos may normally take up so many material that it's hard to put together a follow-up play, but Miracle Contact can do it all by itself with no drawback while recycling your material. But I just wish they would use a different name. I'm sorry, but using a spell means it's not a Contact Fusion. This goes against everything I stand for as a Gladiator Beast stand. Reverse of Neos is a quick play spell that you can activate when a face-up Neos fusion monster you control is destroyed. You special summon an elemental hero Neos from your deck in attack position, it gains a thousand attack, but is destroyed during the end phase of the turn it's summoned. A 3500 attack Neos is pretty big, but you're not likely to leverage it into anything useful. Either the Neos fusion is destroyed during your opponent's turn, in which case it's a temporary nuisance, or it's destroyed during your turn, in which case you better find a fusion to put it back into soon, because if you don't use it, you're gonna lose it. So so despite the name, this card isn't going to be reversing any games anytime soon. Our last piece of support is Next, a normal trap that lets you special summon any number of Elemental Hero Neos, or Neospatian monsters with different names, from your hand and or grave in defense position. But their effects are negated, and as long as you control any of those face-up special summon monsters, you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck except fusion monsters. Also, if you control no cards, you can activate Next directly from your hand. So unlike the card it's referencing, this card actually does work with all the Neospatians. But since your contact fusions will put all those material in the deck where Next can't get to them, it is going to take a bit to set up, and doesn't really play nice with your standard game plan. But despite that, it's similar to Miracle Contact, in that it can put together all the material you need for a contact fusion in one card. And since it works on generic Neospatians, if they ever add to the roster, then I can't wait to see what they do with them next. Issue number four, Assemble. Our remaining hero teams don't have enough entries to warrant their own videos, so we're assembling them all into a single video. We'll cover Evil, Masked, Vision, and Extra Heroes, then wrap things up with some tantalizing trivia and outstanding outliers. Part 1, Evil. Jaden experiences an incredible journey full of twists and turns throughout GX, but perhaps the most memorable was his brief stint as the Supreme King. A personality brought to the surface by Yubel before the two combined their spirits, the Supreme King sought to consume the souls of duelists to complete the legendary Super Polymerization, arguably the most powerful fusion spell ever printed, even in paper. The Supreme King would pivot to evil heroes as his deck of choice, though not completely abandoning elemental heroes, as many of them are required for fusion material. A lot of them even got some sweet alternate arts to fit the aesthetic. Still waiting on that Wildheart one, by the way. Oh, and it should be noted that all evil heroes are fiend monsters. Evil Hero Inferno Prodigy is a level 2 dark monster with 300 attack and 600 defense, and can be special summoned from your hand if you control no monsters. Also, once per turn, during the end phase in which it was tributed, 
enchanted for the tribute summon of a hero monster, you get to draw a card. This can be very helpful in the summon of your bigger heroes, especially Malicious Edge, which we'll get into a bit, but could otherwise have value as a free special summon for Link plays in the modern era. But what spooks me is that this monster shares the same level and battle stat as Hero Kid. Uh, I, I guess the little scrapper took Nova's advice a little too far. Evil Hero Infernal Gainer is a level 4 earth monster with 1600 attack and 0 defense. During your main phase 1 you can banish them from the field, then target a fiend monster you control. That target can make a second attack during each battle phase while you control that face up monster, and Infernal Gainer is special summoned back in attack position after your second standby phase after activation. So not only does this double the threat of your bigger evil heroes, you can just toss this into any fiend deck for the same results. Fabled, Infernoid, Unchained, you can use this monster to help your bosses make some serious gains. Evil Hero Malicious Edge is a level 7 earth monster with 2600 attack and 1800 defense. If your opponent controls any number of monsters, you can tribute some of them face up using a single tribute and deals piercing battle damage. This is a vastly improved version of Blade Edge, giving you the option to tribute with less material if your opponent has any kind of board presence. And since Infernal Prodigy is a free special summon you can use as tribute that gets you a draw, you can deploy this card quickly and efficiently. And on top of that, they're a very accomplished cosplayer. Look. They're even showing off their award-winning Valdo costume. Evil Hero Sinister Necrom is a level 5 dark monster with 1600 attack and 1800 defense, and you can banish them from the grave to special summon an evil hero from your hand or deck, except another copy of itself. Elemental Hero Necroshade has joined the dark side while maintaining an effect that similarly helps you get big monsters onto the field, but in a much more powerful way. However, the pool of monsters you can actually summon with them is still quite small, and only Infernal Gainer and Malicious Edge are really effective targets. This may seem like a high value card, but it misleads you in a very sinister way. Evil Hero Dusted Gold is a level 4 light monster with 2100 attack and 800 defense. You can discard them to add a Dark Fusion, or a card that specifically lists Dark Fusion from your deck to your hand, except another copy of itself. They also can't attack unless you control a fusion monster. Much like how Necroshade is going through a villain arc at the moment, so too is Elemental Hero Captain Gold. And they've really stepped up their game, helping you access fusion spells that will access your evil hero team, including one of the most powerful inboard heroes in the game. It's certainly a great excuse to... Uh, what's up? Do I have to say it? Of course you have to say it! People love puns! Okay. It's certainly a great excuse to dust off your old hero deck. I'm not getting paid for this. Dark Fusion is a normal spell that fusion summons a fiend fusion monster from your extra deck using monsters from your hand or field as fusion material, and the turn it's fusion summoned, it can't be targeted by your opponent's card effects. This encompasses all of your evil hero fusions, so on top of being generally better versions of their original counterparts, they also gain temporary targeting protection, which has actually become more important as the games evolve. And because it can be used generally with fiend fusions, you can also run it in DDDs and Fright Furs, so cards like Infinite and Permanence don't hit that huge target target those fusions would paint on your back. Dark Calling is a normal spell that fusion summons a fusion monster that must be special summoned by Dark Fusion using materials from your hand or grave, and is treated as a fusion summon by Dark Fusion. So it's effectively the miracle fusion of evil heroes, trading in targeting protection for greater ease of summoning. And honestly, it's a pretty good trade-off. Having a one card fusion monster is a lot better than sinking a whole bunch of material into the same monster just to give it temporary protection. You don't get the fun of splashing it into other archetypes, but the amount of value you get out of this card calls to me. Now it's time to talk about the evil hero fusions. They're all still fiends, can only be fusion summoned by the effect of dark fusion, and cannot be special summoned by other ways. Many of them use elemental heroes as material, resulting in evil versions of the monsters that we normally fuse for, which are generally just better, but are held back by the fact you can only fusion summon them with dark fusion. Evil Hero Inferno Wing is a level 6 fire monster with 2100 attack and 1200 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion and Burstinatrix. They deal piercing battle damage, and when they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you burn your opponent for that monster's attack or defense, whichever is higher. Now this is a game ender. Combine this with a way to put your opponent's monster in defense position, especially ones with high attack but low defense, and you can dish out more than 4000 points of damage off of a single attack. It'll really make your opponent Feel the burn. Evil Hero Infernal Sniper is a level 6 fire monster with 2000 attack and 2500 defense, requiring Elemental Hero's 
Clayman, and Burstinatrix, and they cannot be destroyed by spell cards. During each of your standby phases, you inflict a thousand points of damage to your opponent, though they must be in face of defense position to activate and resolve the effect. This card takes away a lot of the baggage Rampart Blaster had. You don't have to worry about any attack shenanigans, it just deals a flat thousand points of damage, and it doesn't even care whether or not your opponent has monsters. Then it just slaps on an anti-dark hole coating just to be safe. This makes Infernal Sniper a stunned player's best friend. It's like if Wave Motion Cannon could protect your life points. Evil Hero Lightning Colm is a level 6 light monster with 2400 attack and 15 defense. It requires Elemental Hero Sparkman and Clayman. Once per turn, you can target a monster on the field and destroy it. That's it. No discard, no worrying about attack value or positions. You just pop a monster. It's also got a huge upgrade in terms of armor. It's way more sleek. Its color scheme is so much more interesting to look at and has just the right amount of edge. It certainly is the way to go. Lum. <laughs> Did I really just say that? Evil Hero Wild Cyclone is a level 8 Earth monster with 1900 attack and 2300 defense, requiring Elemental Heroes Avion and Wild Heart. If they attack, your opponent cannot activate spell and trap cards until the end of the damage step, and when they inflict battle damage to your opponent, you destroy all face down spells and traps your opponent controls. I wouldn't call this strictly better than Wild Wingman, but I would still say it's the better card overall. If your opponent's back row can be freely activated, they'll flip it before the battle phase regardless of which version you use, but Wild Cyclone fixes is the issue of having battle-based spell and trap removal. You just make it so your opponent can't activate them. And once the effect resolves, you've cleared the way for the rest of your team. This card is wild. Evil Hero Dark Gaia is a level 8 earth monster with question mark attack and zero defense, requiring a fiend monster and a rock monster as material, and their original attack is equal to the combined original attack of its fusion material. When Dark Gaia declares an attack, you can change all defense position monsters your opponent controls to face up attack position and flip effects are not activated. Now, the observant among you might have seen that evil heroes don't have a rock monster. Heck. Heroes don't have a rock monster in general, so what's the deal? Well, in the anime, Dark Gaia is made by combining one of the Supreme King's evil heroes with Jim Crocodile Cook's Gaia Plate the Earth Giant by way of super polymerization, which, you know, you can't do in paper, but the anime is wild like that. In proper Yu-Gi-Oh, it's opened the way for people to jam increasingly large fiend and rock type monsters into their deck so they can use Dark Calling to make a whopper of a beater that, because of its effect, will always get in for a huge chunk of damage, helping you to achieve a landslide victory. Evil Hero Malicious Fiend is a level 8 fire monster with 3800 attack and 2100 defense, requiring Evil Hero Malicious Edge and a level 6 or higher fiend monster. During your opponent's battle phase, all monsters your opponent controls are changed to attack position and must attack Malicious Fiend if able. This card is kind of the opposite of Dark Gaia. Instead of finding a single point on your opponent's field you can exploit for massive damage, you punish them for going to the battle phase with a bunch of smaller monsters, or even bigger ones. There are very few monsters that can get over 3500 by themselves. Though the catch is that even a single one can attack over Malicious Fiend to turn the effect off. But if you can apply some more stat boosting effects to make Malicious Fiend even bigger, it'll certainly help you take the edge off of those worries. Evil Hero Malicious Bane is what you get when Malicious Edge gets swole for the summer. This boss monster needs any evil hero and any monster with a level of 5 or higher. Bane upgrades Edge's effect from piercing damage to a full on board wipe for any of your opponent's monsters with equal or less attack than Bane. And with stats of 3000 across the board, it's pretty unlikely they'll have anything bigger. And when they are destroyed, your monster is going to gain 200 attack points for each monster destroyed by this effect. Now combine this with the attack boost and arsenal of Dread Decimator, Sunrise or Honest Neos and you have the supreme king of hero bosses. Anything this card doesn't destroy with its effect will bow down before the king in the battle phase. However, the most evil thing about this card? Well, it's got to be the price point. Supreme King's Castle is a field spell that allows you to fusion summon for any of your evil hero fusions with cards other than dark fusion. Once per turn, during damage calculation, if your fiend monster battles an opponent's monster, you can send an evil hero from your deck or extra deck to the grave, and your monster gains attack equal to the level of the sent monster times 200 until the end of the turn. So if you want to play evil heroes, but don't want to give up the flexibility of polymerization, this is the card for you. And not only does it provide a boost to any of your evil heroes, it can also set up material in your grave to use with Dark Calling. But more importantly than that, it has all the premium amenities. Lava Moat, constantly churning thunderstorms, and an all granite aesthetic makes for the perfect locale to have an epic final battle with your rival of choice. 
Evil Mind is a normal spell that you can activate if you control a fiend monster, and you choose one of the following effects depending on the number of monsters in your opponent's grave. If it's one or more, you draw a card. With four or more, you get to add a hero monster or dark fusion from your deck to your hand. And with ten or more, you can add a polymerization spell or fusion spell from your deck to your hand. It's a shame you can't stack all of these effects if you meet the requirements, but I suppose a draw plus two searches might be a little too much advantage, especially since it's never been easier to throw a bunch of monsters into the grave. But even at its worst, it's an upstart goblin with a hard once per turn downside if you're running a fiend deck, and once the game has progressed to a point where your opponent's yard is filled with monsters, you can search out some of the most powerful spells ever printed. You know if you have a mind to do so. And while not an evil hero themselves, this monster is clearly meant to be used with them. Extra Hero Infernal Divisor is a Link 2 Dark Fiend monster with 1700 attack, requiring two hero monsters as material. If Link summoned, you can reveal a hero fusion monster from your extra deck, and if you do, add up to two of the fusion materials specifically listed on that card, with different names from your deck to your hand, but you cannot special summon monsters the turn you activate that effect, except hero monsters. Also, Fiend Monsters Infernal Divisor points to gain attack and defense equal to that monster's own level times 100. While you can use this to search out material you don't want to see in your opening hand, like Avion or Verstinatrix, its attack boost helps turn Infernal Gainer into a 2000 attack normal summon, puts Inferno Wing at a ferocious 2700 attack, and puts Malicious Bane's starting attack value at 3800. So it's a pretty strong card to assemble your game plan, so long as your opponent leaves you to your own devices. Part 2. Masked. While Jaden Yuki is known for playing elemental heroes, in the manga the deck actually originates with a character called Koyo Hibiki, Jaden's mentor. When this three-time dual monster world champion fell into a coma due to some shadow game shenanigans, his deck was entrusted to Jaden for most of the manga. However, Jaden would eventually pick up masked heroes, switching between the two decks until finally returning elemental heroes to their rightful owner once the big bad of the GX manga had been defeated, and Koyo was able to duel once again. Aesthetically, the masked heroes are based on the tokusatsu juggernaut Kamen Rider. But I know even less about that than I do about American comics, so now it's time for all of you to teach me by dropping all that sweet Kamen Rider trivia in the comments. All the masked heroes are warriors, and they can only be special summoned by the effect of mask change. So before we get into the materialist fusions by way of transformation summoning, let's cover their spell cards. Mask Change is a quick play spell that has you targeting a hero monster you control. You send it to the graveyard, and after that, if it left the field because of that effect, you special summon a masked hero from your extra deck with the same attribute as that monster when it was on the field, or original attribute if it ended up being face downwards into the graveyard. This will be your primary means of deploying your masked heroes, turning things like Shadow Mists and Solid Soldiers into Dark Laws and Dion's respectively. And because it's loaded onto a quick play spell, they can hit the field whenever it's most convenient. Whenever you're looking to punish your opponent or searching cards out of nowhere, or just trying to pile on more damage to close out a game, this card is a mask change you can believe in. Mask Change 2 is a quick play spell that has you discard a card, then target a face-up monster you control that has a level. You send it to the graveyard, and after that, if it left the field because of that effect, you special summon a masked hero monster from your extra deck with the same attribute and a higher level than the sent monster had on the field, using their original attribute and level if it gets flipped face down before being sent to the grave. And a summon from Mask Change 2 counts as being summoned by the original Mask Change. While this can be used to splash masked heroes in just about anything, many of them rely on other hero cards to make the most of their effect. And cards that don't, like Vapor or Divine Wind, don't have effects that really warrant using up deck space. But Dark Law is the exception, who's extremely powerful in just about any matchup. Dark decks would fall over themselves trying to find a way to fit these cards into their deck. Locking out the grave is such a monumental blow that most people didn't even think twice about its inclusion. Form Change is a quick play spell that has you targeting any hero fusion monster you control. You return it to the extra deck, then special summon a masked hero from your extra deck with the same level as that monster's original level, but with a different name. And this is also treated as being summoned by Masked Change. This is a fairly unique follow-up to standard Mask Change plays, as it allows you to access monsters you otherwise wouldn't have the attribute for. For instance, if you only have access to Stratos on board and not Shadow Mist, you can Mask Change them into Blast, use their effect, then Form Change them into Dark Law. Or Mask Change a Prisma into a Koga, reduce a monster's attack, then Form Change into Diane to run over them for a free summon. It may not see a lot of play, but if Masked Heroes ever get more focus on them, it'll be in good form. 
Mask Charge is a normal spell that has you targeting a hero monster and a change quick play spell in your grave and adding them to your hand. Just a quick, simple plus one that gives you all the material you need to get back into the Masked Hero game so they can lead to the charge. Now it's time for the fusions. Masked Hero Blast is a level 6 win monster with 2200 attack and 1800 defense, and if it's special summoned, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls, and its attack becomes half its current attack permanently. Also, as a quick effect, you can pay 500 life points to target a spell or trap your opponent controls and return it to the hand. It's not quite as permanent as hard removal, but it does get around destruction triggers against certain cards like Waking the Dragon. And much like its elemental hero counterpart, Great Tornado, it helps to soften up an opponent's monster so you can put them on BLAST. No? Okay. Masked Hero Dark Lord is a level 6 dark monster with 2400 attack and 1800 defense, and while they're on the field, all cards sent to your opponent's graveyard are banished instead. Once per turn, if your opponent adds a card from their deck to their hand, except during the draw phase or damage step, you can banish a random card from your opponent's hand. This is the card that put the Masked Heroes on the map. Before Hero Strike Structure Deck, the most they could accomplish was Absolute Zero into Acid Plays, which were very strong, don't get me wrong, but required a lot of specific resources to pull off. But now, especially with the assistance of Shadow Mist, Dark Law could hit the field early and derail an entire game plan all on its own, shutting down advantage engines and making hand fixing effects much riskier. So it's kind of like a proto Thunder Dragon Colossus in that regard, using powerful floodgate effects to really lay down the law. Also, I just want to point out that it kind of looks like Kamen Rider Amazon. I think it might have predicted that 2016 overly edgy reboot. Ruthless my ass, Shirakura. Masked Hero Goka is a level 6 fire monster with 2200 attack and 1800 defense and gains 100 attack for each hero monster in your graveyard. This is basically the same effect as elementary hero Eskuri Dao, except you can't use Goka to enable a strong super poly, and we don't exactly have a huge offering of effective fire attribute heroes to work with, so I certainly don't hold a flame for this hero. Masked Hero Vapor is a level 6 water monster with 2400 attack and 2000 defense and cannot be destroyed by card effects. Unfortunately, it's still susceptible to targeting, and 2400 is fairly easy to get over in battle when compared to similar monsters, but at least Vapor has completed the States of Matter cycle that Solid and Liquid Soldier set up. Masked Hero Acid is a level 8 water monster with 2600 attack and 2100 defense. When special summoned, you destroy as many spell and traps your opponent controls as possible, and if you do, all monsters your opponent controls will lose 300 attack. Trust me, makes all the difference. It's very important that he does that. <clears throat> The infamous second part of the Absolute Zero Acid combo, entwining these two effects leads to a complete board wipe against the opponent, and leaves them open for a full-scale assault. And blowing up the back row may not always seem like the most impactful effect, the chain block does allow Absolute Zero to go off, and it can cause quite an acid splash. Masked Hero Anki is a level 8 dark monster with 2800 attack and 1200 defense, and can attack directly, but when it does so using that effect, the battle damage inflicted is halved. Also, when they destroy a monster by battle and send it to the grave, you can add a change quick play spell from your deck to your hand. Anki is the definition of an aggro card, pressuring your opponent on all sides to force out answers. If they have an attack position monster that you can get over, sweet! You run over it with Anki and get a search. Is it too big for Anki to defeat? Then you just chip in for 1400 while waiting for your own answer. And since it can be mask changed into existence, Anki can be dropped into the middle of a battle phase at the drop of a hat to cause even more mayhem. Also, side note, Anki has the best drip out of the entire Masked Hero lineup. Who doesn't want those claw boots? Masked Hero Dian is a level 8 earth monster with 2800 attack and 3000 defense. When Dian destroys an opponent's monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can special summon a level 4 or lower hero from your deck. Dian kind of works like Anki, but trades the wide range of utility for broader search capabilities. Effectively, you can summon a Shadow Mist off of its effect to add a mask or form change like Anki can, but you can also summon Stratos for back row removal or to search cards like Honest Neos. Oh, and in a pinch, 3000 defense will hold the line against a lot of attackers. Unfortunately, Solid Soldier is your only viable earth type target to use, but as soon as better options become available, I'm positive this card will shine on like the crazy diamond it is. Masked Hero Divine Wind is a level 8 wind monster with 2700 attack and 1900 defense. They cannot be destroyed by battle, your opponent can only attack with a single monster during each battle phase, and when Divine Wind destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the grave, you can draw a card. 
This card actually kinda slaps, if only during simplified game states. Normally at that point, effect removal is at an all-time low, so having a monster that owns the battle phase like this while also helping you draw into cards to put you ahead is outstanding. However, in just about every other case, its utility is outshined by Blast, as that monster can remove back row threats while actually putting an opponent's monster low enough to get over. In comparison, Divine Wind is little more than some minor turbulence. Masked Hero Kuga. Uh, it's pronounced Koga? I have been informed it is Koga. Masked Hero Koga is a level 8 light monster with 2500 attack and 1800 defense, but gains 500 attack for each monster your opponent controls. Once per turn, during either player's turn, you can banish a hero monster from your grave, then target a face-up monster on the field, and that target loses attack equal to the attack of the banished hero until the end of the turn. This acts as a kind of reversed Honest Neos. Instead of dropping monsters out of your hand to gain attack, you banish them out of your grave to make the opponent lose that attack. And even without that, it does an amazing job of punishing your opponent for going wide with their field. Even a single monster bumps them up to 3000, and even one additional monster can put Koga out of reach of a lot of attackers. It's an outrageously powerful monster during the battle phase, and has a bit of a knack for lighting up the battlefield. Part 3. Vision. Much like how Jaden has a much different deck between the anime and the manga, so too does Aster Phoenix. On the printed page, he wields the Vision Heroes, dark attribute warrior monsters that wear giant helmets with huge zoom lenses. Now, this may seem completely random, but it's actually a pun on an ability many of them share. When you take damage, they can be placed from your grave to your spell and trap zone face up as continuous traps, and during any main phase, you contribute a hero monster you control to special summon them from your spell and trap zone. The first part of this effect is shown in the manga as them returning as ghostly apparitions, or in other words, as visions, which, you know, giant zoom lenses might help out with. Get it? Let's start with the ones that do have this effect. Vision Hero Minimum Ray is a level 3 monster with 1200 attack and 700 defense, and if special summoned from the spell and trap zone, you can destroy a level 4 or lower monster your opponent controls. So it acts as removal, but only for a very thin slice of the game. It can't affect a large majority of extra deck monsters, and its capacity for beating up main deck monsters is limited to the lower third of the level totem pole. Yeah, Ray does something, but... Honestly, it's the bare minimum. Vision Hero Multiply Guy is a level 3 monster with 800 attack and 700 defense, and if special summoned from the spell and trap zone, you can grant one face-up monster you control a permanent 800 attack boost. When it comes to summoning a lot of Vision Heroes in a row, it's nice to have Multiply Guy as a way to buff another monster as part of the combo. 800 is a huge deal, and can mean the difference between baiting out a negation body to leave the door open for your other plays, and you getting run over by them. They may not seem like much on the surface, but Hey, they're a pretty cool guy. Vision Hero Poisoner is a level 3 monster with 900 attack and 700 defense, and if special summoned from the spell and trap zone, you can permanently have the attack of a face-up monster on the field. While Multiply Guy is good for slowly building up a single monster so it can anchor your field, Poisoner excels in turning your opponent's monsters from threats to jokes. I can't think of a single monster in wide use nowadays that, if it had its attack halved, would still be a credible combat threat to any competent normal summon. When it comes to ruining the combat potential of your opponent's monsters, this card does a great job of poisoning the well. Vision Hero Increase is a level 3 monster with 900 attack and 1100 defense, and if special summoned from the spell and trap zone, you can special summon a level 4 or lower Vision Hero from your deck. Now this may sound like it's really good for its wide range of options for you to choose from, but honestly, there's only one that matters. It matters a whole lot, don't get me wrong, but since many of your Vision Heroes won't trigger off of this effect, it's not going to do much to increase your options. Moving away from the ones that can place themselves in the spell and trap zone, the preferred target for increased effect is Vision Hero Vion. They are level 4 monster with 1000 attack and 1200 defense, and when normal or special summoned, you can send a hero monster from your deck to the grave. Also, they can banish a hero from your grave to add a polymerization from your deck to your hand. So even on a normal summon, Vion does a lot for you. You can either send a malicious to the grave to summon another one, setting up for further plays, or you can send a shadow mist to search a hero monster. Then, while it's still on the field, you can just grab a polymerization to make sure you can get access to your fusions. And if you summon them off increase, you can all do this without even committing to your normal summon, making the search option with Shadow Mist even more tantalizing. It may not be the flashiest of the heroes, but it certainly has an eye for planning. 
And a great way to set all of this up is with Vision Hero Ferris, a level 5 monster with 1600 attack and 1800 defense. And you can discard another hero monster in your hand to special summon them from your hand. If normal or special summoned in any way, you can place a Vision Hero from your deck to your spell and trap zone as a continuous trap, except another copy of itself, and you cannot special summon monsters from the extra deck for the rest of the turn except for hero monsters. This is a linchpin for modern day hero builds. The normal summon is a huge choke point that our opponents are more than willing to exploit. But with Ferris's ability to start us off without the normal summon, your opponent now has to contend with your plays on two different fronts. It does bite that it locks you into only hero summons from the extra for the rest of the turn, but I think it's more than Ferris. Vision Hero Gravito is a level 4 monster with 500 attack and 2000 defense. When normal or special summoned, you can target one of your banished heroes and add them to your hand. You can also tribute them to target two vision heroes in your spell and trap zone and special summon them. This is actually a pretty cool summon in any version of modern hero decks, as there is a surprising amount of banishing. Bion and Miracle Fusion are both very powerful effects that set up Gravito to put them back in rotation. And as part of a vision hero package, they can get you two effects and monsters for the price of one, meaning that pure decks will likely gravitate towards this card. Vision Hero Witch Raider is a level 8 monster with 2700 attack and 1900 defense, and you can use trap cards to tribute summon for them, as well as monsters. When normal summoned, you can destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls, but you cannot special summon monsters the turn you activate that effect, except for hero monsters. Considering the fact that Vision Heroes can just pop into your back row for free, it won't be too hard to gather the tribute fodder needed for Witch Raider's summon. But since you can tribute any trap card, you could get rid of any floodgates that are holding up your own game plan before clearing out all of your opponent's back row. It's a great card for going second if you anticipate a lot of spell and trap interaction, and they probably have the biggest renaissance fair energy I've ever seen in a card. Apparition is a normal trap that you can activate when a face-up hero monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effect. When it resolves, you special summon a level 4 or lower vision hero from your deck, then permanently have the original attack and defense of one monster your opponent controls. This frustratingly doesn't get Ferris, but you can still get Vion while still debuffing a powerful monster. But what gets me is that Apparition is effectively another retrain of Hero Signal. It's nice they updated it a little bit, sure, but I still don't think it will appear in deck lists anytime soon. Vision Release is a normal spell that has you targeting a Vision Hero in your spell and trap zone and special summoning it. Also, during a main phase in which Vision Release was not sent to the grave, you can banish it to target a Vision Hero in your grave and add it to your hand. This helps you summon out your Vision Heroes if you don't have the Tribute Fodder to do it with their own effect, but can also summon Vision Heroes that don't have the effect inherently, like Gravito and Vion, if you set them there with Ferris. And it can even put Ferris back in your hand so you can use it on later turns. And while it would be strange for you to put Gravito and Vion where you couldn't get them normally, it is nice that this card exists just in case. Because when that happens, they're both figuratively and literally trapped. Vision Fusion is a normal spell that lets you fusion summon any hero monster from your extra deck using monsters from your hand or field as fusion material. But you can also use up to two monsters being treated as continuous traps in your spell and trap zone as material by banishing them. Since a lot of newer cards effectively lock you into hero summons, the only thing polymerization has over this card is the latter searchability. Some of our fusions can get pretty cost intensive, so using free monsters out of your back row can really help you visualize a new way to victory. And speaking of fusions, Vision Heroes have a few of their own. Vision Hero Adoration is a level 8 fusion monster with 2800 attack and 2100 defense, requiring any two hero monsters as material. Once per turn, you can target a face-up monster your opponent controls and one other hero monster you control, and your opponent's targeted monster loses attack and defense equal to the attack of your hero that was targeted. In the long hero tradition of manipulating battle stats, Adoration is here to bring their own spin on it, debuffing your opponent's monsters based on what you currently control. While this doesn't quite have the same immediate satisfaction as a card like Koga, Adoration makes for an excellent addition to a lineup, allowing you to debuff at zero cost, which, in this resource-intensive game, is an effect that we simply adore. Vision Hero Trinity, Trinity is a level 8 fusion monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, requiring any three hero monsters as material. After being fusion summoned for the rest of the turn, Trinity's attack becomes double its original attack. While being fusion summoned, Trinity can attack up to three times during each battle phase, but can't ever, ever attack directly. While three heroes is a bit much for summoning anything, this card certainly 
deserves the investment. Wielding a combined damage output of 15,000 on the turn it summoned, Trinity can turn a fairly developed board against its owner, punching medium-sized creatures for game, or ensuring the removal of the most powerful if that can't be accomplished immediately. And while it loses its Titanic attack stat after that initial turn, it still has three attacks to use the rest of the game to make sure the board remains wiped for the rest of your cards. Sometimes the third hero's the charm it looks like. Part 4. Extra. This part's going to be pretty short, but I feel like they should at least get their own section for how unique they are. The extra heroes are all Link monsters, and the first, tournament legal, hero extra deck monster to be anything other than a fusion, and were a clear concession to Master Rule 4's reliance on Link monsters to use any other extra deck mechanic. Nowadays, they aren't quite as important for their Link arrows, but they thankfully come with some wildly powerful effects. We've already covered Cross Crusader in Issue 2, and Infernal Divisor earlier in this issue, so let's start with Extra Hero Wonder Driver. They're a Link 2 Light Warrior monster with 1900 attack, requiring two hero monsters as material. If a hero monster is normal or special summoned to your zone this card points to, you can target a Polymerization spell card, Fusion spell card, or change Quick Play spell in your grave, and set it to your field. Also, if they're destroyed by battle, or by an opponent's effect while in your possession and sent to the grave, you can special summon any hero monster from your hand. That last effect is rather situational, so you shouldn't worry too much about activating it as anything more than an insurance policy. Rather, think of it as a way to reuse a fusion spell to extend your turns before folding Wonder Driver into our Link 3, which we'll get into in a bit. Suffice it to say, this little wonder really helps kick your engines into overdrive. Extra Hero Dread Decimator is a Link 3 Dark Warrior monster with 2500 attack, requiring two or more hero monsters. They deal piercing battle damage, and they gain 100 attack for each hero monster with different names in your grave, and also grants that bonus to any hero monster they point to. This card acts as the final and most important piece for your OTKs. The amount of attack gained across your entire field by this one effect quickly gets out of control. It does nothing to advance your actual game plan, but as a destination, your opponent's gonna dread dealing with it. Part 5, Postscript. This section covers cards that don't quite fit into any other categories we've gone over so far, but should still be covered nonetheless. Phantom Magician is a level 3 dark spellcaster with 600 attack and 700 defense, and when destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon a hero with 1000 or less attack from your deck in face-up defense position. This card had a brief stint in the GX manga, effectively being used as a floater to get a vision hero, which explains why it can only grab heroes with such small attack stats. But despite the low ceiling on attack points, it can still summon some pretty relevant monsters like Shadow Mist and Vion. It can even summon Woodsman in the perfect position, solving a lot of the card's issues. And honestly, it's probably the best magic trick I've ever seen from a spellcaster monster. UFO Roid Fighter is a level 10 light machine fusion monster with question mark attack and defense, requiring a UFO Roid and any warrior type monster as material, and its original attack and defense become the combined original attack of the two monsters used for its fusion summon. It has absolutely nothing to do with heroes, but it did debut in the anime as a fusion of Jaden's elemental hero Tempest and Cyrus's UFO Roid, making it another in a long line of monsters that combine a protagonist's monster with one of their best friends. E Hero Pit Boss is a rank 6 level Light Spellcaster Xyz Monster with 2600 attack and 2k defense. It requires 3 level 6 monsters. They must be Xyz summoned and can't be special by other ways. If Pit Boss attacks your opponent directly and reduces their life points to zero while it has an Xyz material that was originally a Spellcaster monster, you win the match. But you can't actually use it in officially recognized tournaments because it's part of the prize card family. They can turn a best of 3 into a best of 1. Notable pieces of trivia, this isn't an elemental hero, but an entertainment hero coming at us straight from the glitz and glam of the Yu-Gi-Oh World Championship 2013 held in Las Vegas. I can't imagine how much they must have had to pay to reserve the venue though, because odds are, it's pretty pricey. And speaking of World Championship promos, Get Your Game On is a continuous spell that you can only play if you are present for the 2007 Yu-Gi-Oh! Trading Card Game World Championship. And while it's on the field, the attack of all your elemental heroes and Neospatians on the field are doubled. This reminds me of that Pokemon TCG card, the Birthday Pikachu, where you can write your name into the card's name and get a bonus effect if it was your birthday. It'd be very hard to disprove you were at said World Championship if you're old enough, but imagine if you got to have a 5,000 attack Neos monster. That's certainly an awesome way to play! 
favorite hero with an equip spell that can only be equipped to a level 5 or higher hero monster. If you control any card in your field zone, the equipped monster gains attack equal to its original defense and also the opponent cannot target the equipped monster with card effects. At the start of the battle phase, you can activate a field spell from your hand or deck and when the equipped monster attacks and destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, the attacking monster can make a second attack in a row. This makes for an outstanding piece of protection that can be set up for some very spicy situations. Equip it to a Neos fusion and you can ensure that Neos space is on the field and ready to help. Equip it to Dark Claw, play any utility field spell you want and have an untargetable flood key monster with 4200 attack. Or put it on Elemental Hero Mariner, use favorite hero to set up Mystic Mine and you can attack directly all day long with 2400 attack points of damage. But unfun game stays aside, I do honestly think it's amazing that provided it meets the level requirements, you can literally grant this to your favorite hero monster to elevate them to new heights. Well, back at class, they never taught us this. Generation Next is a quick play spell that you can only activate if your life points are lower than your opponent's. When it resolves, you add to your hand or a special summon an E-Hero, Karibo, or Neo Spatian from your deck or grave with an attack equal or less in difference to the life points of you and your opponent. But for the rest of the turn, you can't activate cards or effects of the same name as the card you grabbed. Drawing from GX, both the name of the series and its opening theme, Generation Next is an interesting search card that gets better the tougher the times and harder the climbs. While the effect freeze that hinders any instant gratification is pretty hit or miss, you can still activate this on your opponent's turn, add the card to your hand, and then just use it when it rolls back over to your turn to help out with your next play. With this by your side, you'll make the grade and win the fight, but you better play your cards right. Get in my hunt, get your game in my hunt. Come on, you better play your cards. Okay? Time for the cameos. Fusion Tag isn't specifically hero support, but it does have Sparkman and Flame Wingman on it. And speaking of other appearances, Air Neo shows up on Dimension Explosion, and Flame Wingman shows up in Cross Dimensional Duel, as well as in Hero Ring. Hero Metal also bears the name, and looks like some kind of hero is wearing it, but it's basically just a worse waking the dragon. We've also got a couple of cards with dual discs in them that have close enough names. Destruction of Destiny was used by Aster, basically as a self-mill card to fuel Shining Phoenix Enforcer, and Heroes Rule 2 was used by Jaden, which is a sequel to the anime-only card Heroes Rule 1. A hero emerges is very similar to Hero Counter-Attack, but features Zombira the Dark. This is likely another reference to the Yu-Gi-Oh manga, as Zombira is based on or influenced by an American superhero in the fiction of the original Yu-Gi-Oh manga known as Zombire, a god of death that fights for justice. And that's it. Every hero card ever printed as of July of 2021. Here's hoping we don't see any hero updates for a while, it'd be pretty upsetting for this to become obsolete so soon. This has been an incredible undertaking, and I'm so thankful for everyone who tuned in to watch. I'm also thankful for everyone who took time out of their schedules to help with voicing these cards. My workload would have been immeasurably larger if I didn't have their help, so they all deserve some very special shoutouts. Uh, first I want to mention Big Toads 2197 and Nightmare 88. They're all fairly new to Yugi tubing and have yet to really find their footing, so I'd like to ask you all to give them a look and give them some respectful comments, let them know what you like about them so they know what to focus on, I'm sure it'll be a huge help. If you keep an eye on the community tab, you know I do a lot of work with Casual Card Gamer and JC Theater Yu-Gi-Oh! It's always a huge treat, and I was ecstatic that they wanted to help voice these. Uh, especially since JC had the wild idea of doing all the field spells, so if you caught onto that little pattern, then congratulations. A Casual Card Gamer has a bit of variety, they open Yu-Gi-Oh! and Vanguard. Uh, they've got a lot of Vanguard gameplay going up on the channel to celebrate the recent version of the game that just came out. We do a Yu-Gi-Oh! news podcast called In the Yu-Gi-Oh! and a physical C only series called Out of the Box. It's really fun. JC Theater Yu-Gi-Oh! does long and short form video essays that are both informative and hilarious. This guy's a gem and deserves a ton more attention than he's currently getting. Hakatana has a fan fiction that's effectively its own Yu-Gi-Oh! spin-off series, Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross, complete with its own new summoning mechanic, Overdrive Monsters. Kale, Porcelain, and Captain Blitz are all mods on the Discord, and I can't thank them enough. They're always there to help around the community when I need it, and Blitz has even begun their own journey into Yugi tubing as well, and I've gotta say they're off to a stellar start. Porcelain makes some of the most adorable drawings I've ever seen, and while Kale currently specializes in strong Twitter posting energy and running the Sylvan Discord, uh, keep an eye out, you may see some updates. Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh! is also looking to break out into the Yu-Gi-Oh! scene. Check them out if you're looking for some replays, because they have a lot of them. 
Noah Jenk is an incredibly skilled video essayist who's primarily known for their series What's in a Duel, where he breaks down some of the most iconic duels across the entire show's history and highlights what exactly makes them so effective and memorable. TCG Tally casts a wide net when it comes to content, but what I want to focus on is the Structure Deck Progression series, where he and Jamie each pick one of a pair of Structure Decks each episode to build on their collection, moving in chronological order to see who can come out on top. Scapegoat hosts a plethora of podcasts with a ton of amazing guests, and is one of the most energetic and vibrant voices in the community, and is one of the few duelists I've ever seen skilled enough to ever beat Seto Kaiba, and if that isn't an accomplishment, I don't know what is. Red Eyes Jackalo features a whole bunch of replays on Yu-Gi-Oh! games and Let's Plays of his time with the Yu-Gi Mons Nuzlocke, but they also have a series called Yu-Gi-Oh! Engineering, which is all about covering and evaluating the engines utilized by various decks and seeing how those engines can be isolated and added to different decks. Dire Yu-Gi-Oh! makes short combo videos, the Idiot's Guide series, which is perfect for me and I look forward to it every week. They also have the wildest progression series idea I've ever seen, Fusion Factory, which I can't really do justice here, you have to go watch it right now. Crystal Abundance is always fun to watch, she's got this great welcoming energy that's infectious in all their streams, definitely follow them on Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube, you won't regret it. Karma ZVT is a VTuber from the future that has come to pilot mechs and play Yu-Gi-Oh! along with a variety of other games. And honestly, the more Yu-Gi-Oh! VTubers we can get, the better. Corbinisms is just a treat to see on Twitter, you gotta follow him. Yu-Gi-Oh! Pulse definitely keeps their fingers on the pulse of the game, covering every officially recognized format, which means regular TCG content, as well as Duel Links and Speed Duels, so there's a lot to sink your teeth into. Habri makes Yu-Gi-Oh! AMVs, which I have not seen in forever, so if you miss seeing the ancient art of anime music videos, definitely give them a watch. The Slifer Slacker is your one-stop shop for hero content. Whether it's anime edits, fan dubs, or another series that covers every single hero card ever printed, they've got you covered. From the Deck to the YT is just as much of a Dante fan as I am and makes deck profiles, Yu-Gi-Oh! tutorials, and song covers, but their biggest selling point is their wry sense of humor that you just don't get anywhere else. Alexis YT has quite a bit of videos on Duel Links, Legacy of the Duelist, and my personal favorite, purchasing and showing off fake Yu-Gi-Oh cards, which are always a treat to see. They're also, like, the only person I see talking about Yu-Gi-Oh 7, so she's been a big help in getting to keep up with it. Rook's Table is someone I cannot say enough good things about. They're my primary source for Speed Duel content, they have an outstanding voice for commentary, no doubt honed from casting numerous live video game events, but they also open some Magic the Gathering from time to time, as well as Paint Minis, which, as a tabletop player myself, is of particular interest to me. The Haver Card Man is making market watches and deck profiles on some out there decks. They also make the Yu-Gi-Oh! Synthesis audio drama, which you should totally be watching, and not just because I do the narration. And if you want to see an example of their work, you don't need to go very far, because on this channel you just have to watch the Magic Key Explained episode, they did all the visual and audio edits for it, and it's fantastic. Bumbles McFumbles has gone through a pretty major content shift recently, pivoting over to whichever video game related topic his eldritch unknowable mind settles on, but he's also made quite a few videos of custom voice lines, as if a number of iconic Yu-Gi-Oh monsters became playable characters in Duel Links. It's wonderfully creative and outstandingly executed, but since then, Bumbles has been the victim of an algorithm that hates it when creators stray from their starting path. Trust me, Every video they make is a bundle of laughs, so as a personal favor to me, please go watch this man's content. Mage of Ancients makes a ton of deck profiles and is really ramping up their streaming. For a handle on their style, they have a deck profile from April for Cyber Dragons that starts with a simple combo, so you know you're learning some useful info right off the bat without having to deal with much filler. Kiri MK1 is doing a lot of remote dueling over on their Twitch, and they have some very informative videos on YouTube about the decks they play. Neshi? is the Crystal Beast King. Every video is about them, but don't mistake that for being out of touch, as he finds a way to add them into a lot of current decks to show off how powerful they can be, even in a modern context. If you need a steady stream of Jesse Anderson energy, Neshi is the place to go. Akorian has just wrapped a Heroes Singles Only series, attempting to build the deck we just talked about on a scheduled budget. It's an interesting way to see the development of a deck step by step, without having to worry that some episodes will just be duds because of bad pulls. 
I also couldn't have done this without the help of my lovely patrons, who are making it more possible every day that I can support myself just by doing this for all of you. We've got our illustrious Quasar Commander, J. Yuri Boy, as well as Nebula Navigators, the Wizard Moose, and the Fresh Prince of Conair, our Cosmic Crusaders, Chaz Ghost, Colin Todd, Panda PLS, Legendary Raven, and Shep Shao Shep, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you've made it this far, then I've got a good feeling that you liked what you watched, and it would mean the world to me if you could join these fine patrons, where you can get access to my video scripts and deck lists from streams, as well as exclusive voting rights for an explained video once a month, or by becoming a channel member, which is basically like a Twitch sub, so you can gain access to some very colorful emotes. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye